On behalf of the Maryland State Bar Association Criminal Law and Practice section, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to our presentation on criminal practice in the circuit court. Thank you so much for attending this program. I am Christine Celeste, along with Warren Alperstein and Ryan Dimmick. I co-chair the Education Committee of the Criminal Law and Practice section. I wanna take a moment to thank that committee, particularly Erica Souter for putting together this program. Um, and I wanna most especially thank our panel of experts, Bob Bonsib, Andy Jezik, and Jimenez Chicas for sharing their time and their expertise with us. Uh, thank you also to Megan Coleman, who's a senior associate at Marcus Sponsor for preparing uh, the materials on opening statements and closing arguments that have been provided to the participants today. Um, I guess let's get um, started with the program. Let me introduce my first speaker, Robert Bonsib. Bob is a founding member of Marcus, Marcus Sponsive LLC, where he concentrates his practice in criminal defense in the state and federal trial courts and the Maryland and District of Columbia appellate courts. Before entering private practice, Bob was a prosecutor for 18 years, first in Prince George's County and then in the United States Attorney's Office. He has tried over 300 jury trials across the state and in the federal court. Bob has been a member of the Criminal Pattern Jury Instruction Committee since 1990 and has presented training programs to prosecutors and defense attorneys across the country. He has received many awards, including the Criminal Law and Practice Section's Robert C. Heaney Memorial Award and the John Adams Award for Service to the Criminal Justice Act program. Bob has testified as an expert in criminal law and procedure in the circuit court for Prince George's County, and he is here today to share his expertise with us. Uh, please welcome, and it's my pleasure to introduce Bob Bonson. Bob, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. It's a pleasure to be with you and everybody uh, on the uh, panel here today, as well as those who are in various places around uh, our region. Uh, hopefully today we can have some fun uh, with uh, uh, a presentation that I uh, have put together on uh, opening statements and closing arguments. Uh, some of this is going to be uh, educational. Uh, some of it uh, hopefully will be fun. Um, and I, as we go through it, you'll uh, uh, at the end of this, at least have one individual's idea about how uh, I like to uh, put together opening uh, statements and closing arguments. Uh, everybody does it their own way. Everybody has their own style. The focus uh, today is going to be a little bit more heavily on opening statements than in closing arguments, because I think sometimes opening statements are the um, uh, forgotten stepchild of, of what we do. But it's also, I think, important for us to sort of remember the why, why we're doing this and, and the themes um, that uh, that are important for us to uh, to remember. Now, gentlemen, in this country, our courts are the great levelers. In our courts, all men are created equal. I'm no idealist to believe firmly in the integrity of our courts and of our jury system. That's no ideal to me. That is a living, working reality. Now, we all hope to have that as, a, as an operating theme. We've all been around long enough to know that uh, that ideal isn't always uh, realized in, in our system, but to the extent that we approach uh, perfection in seeking to realize it, uh, we each have to keep our our heads up and, and our energy level up and to do the best that we can. I do want to say before we go any uh, any further on this, and as Christine pointed out, um, uh, my colleague uh, at Marcus Bonds, uh, Megan Coleman, has put together an extraordinarily thorough uh, resource uh, piece that's attached to this program uh, with all of the significant cases on opening and closing uh, opening statements and closing arguments. And I certainly uh, encourage you to, to keep it in a, in a handy place. And uh, I know Andy's going to get to his uh, handout when he gets uh, to it, but it is also remarkable. 
And those two uh, uh, pieces uh, ought to carry you uh, well into the future and make this program uh, very, very worthwhile for you. So we don't know what the future is going to hold. We don't know how we're going to land in a few weeks, hopefully not a few months. I hope everybody is staying safe, but we are going to have to be, I think, creative as we get back into the courtrooms and uh, figure out how we do what we did before, uh, but in a new in a new kind of way. So this is going to be a refresher. Uh, I am sure amongst the folks that are uh, participating today that there are uh, some newbies and some, some old farts like me, and uh, some of this will be uh, old hat. Uh, some of it may be new or different. Um, I, hope, uh, I hope it is enjoyable. So the presentation is going to consist of uh, Megan's handout, which you have, some practical suggestions, some random thoughts of, of mine, and just hopefully some just plain fun stuff. So we all know that when we walk into the courtroom, oftentimes jurors look at us as Darth Vader, perhaps more on the defense side than the prosecution side. But one of the things that I learned when I was a prosecutor and in instructing uh, my colleagues about how they wore the white hat and then moved into the private practice sector is the white hat gets worn on both sides of the uh, of the uh, well of the court. And so we all need to continue to remember that we are there doing good things and should be proud of what we do, regardless of what side we're on. Every trial is different. They all come in different shapes and flavors, and we've got to be uh, flexible and creative uh, to match what we're doing uh, to the nature of the case. And lawyers are different. We all have our own style, and whatever suggestions I make today are part of my style. Maybe some of them will work for you. Maybe they won't, but what is most important is that you do what makes you feel comfortable uh, in your presentations. So what I said a few minutes ago is that I think the opening statement oftentimes is a missed opportunity. The number of times that I have uh, uh, defaulted, particularly in my younger uh, years, on uh, using an opening statement to its fullest advantage, uh, they, were, they were mistakes. You have the opportunity with an opening statement uh, to set the stage for what the jury is going to hear and how you approach it whether you're, if you're a prosecutor, is different than if you're defense counsel. So prosecutors have the advantage of constructing. They get to go first. They can present their opening statement and essentially have it prepared A to Z. Defense counsel can do the same, but we have to uh, be prepared to react to what happens when the prosecutor makes uh, an opening statement. So part of what is a, a theme of the presentation today is the need to be flexible, the need to be able to react to what is going on uh, in front of you. It's also important to always be pumped up. This is fun stuff. We're not trial lawyers because we don't enjoy it. We love the battle, we love the fight, we get pumped up for it, and we got to continue to uh, get pumped up for it. The way you get pumped up, though, and the way that you can be confident has a lot to do with preparation. The control of the courtroom uh, is something that we all want to have, and we need to be perceived by the jury to be in control. And if we can't be in control of the entire courtroom, we need to be control in control of at least our part of it. And how you maintain control is also a function of the level of confidence you have in what you're doing. And the level of confidence that you have is going to be directly related to how prepared you are. It also has to do with how you present yourself in the courtroom. How often have we seen lawyers run into the courtroom five minutes late while the jury's sitting in the box? You know, when I, my kids were growing up, I like to tell them, you know, a, an appointment 
is a commitment. It's not a suggestion. In the courtroom, we should remember that our need to be there on time is a commitment. And it's also part of the image that you present to jurors. When you come into the courtroom, if you have the courtroom shuffle going on, you got crap all over your, your table, you're trying to find that exhibit, you're not gonna look uh, confident to the jury, you're not gonna look in charge to the jury, and you're not gonna feel good about that when you're shuffling around. So everybody has their own way of preparing things, whether it's a trial notebook, whether it's folders, whatever works for you, but have a system, have it together. Remember, you can persuade if they're not laughing at you. You can persuade better if you exude a professional image. Coming into the courtroom with your tie undone, coming in with what looks like you know fancy pajamas, not that too many people do that, but sometimes you wonder where lawyers got the idea that coming into courtroom and not meeting that image of professionalism somehow is helpful. So you you got two things that you can you, you can do. You can look like a slob or you can look like somebody who's with it. Remember also that we don't always have the best case. We don't always have the best argument. But we always have the opportunity to make our argument the best. So opening statements, closing arguments the approach and the rules for defense and for prosecution are not the same. You know, as I said, prosecutors have the benefit of building. They can know, uh, you know, a week ahead of time what they want to say in their opening statement. Sometimes, you know, I find myself, you know, finalizing mine as I'm dry driving on the ICC from my home to the courthouse, uh, trying to uh, figure out what the last uh, effort's going to be. But it's not fixed in stone. So prosecution builds in their opening. The defense, you should have a pretty good idea, but you need to keep flexibility. When it comes to the opening close, same thing with the prosecution. By that point, they probably have got a pretty good idea of what they're going to do. Uh, we should as well on the defense side, but again, you got to be flexible. But the rebuttal argument, now the prosecutor, the prosecutor's got to be thinking. Because if you have scripted out your rebuttal argument before it's time for your rebuttal, you're probably not going to be very effective. If you already know what you're going to say, if you already have it written out, then it really isn't a rebuttal argument. I also would, would note that when I hear a judge say uh, to counsel, how long is it going to be, uh, how long are you going to be with your closing uh, uh, arguments? And the, and the prosecutor says, well, I'm probably going to be about 10 or 15 minutes on my opening and, you know, 15 or 20 minutes on my closing. Not that I hear that said too often. I say to myself, somebody's setting up to sandbag me. Rebuttal is supposed to be rebuttal. It's not your opportunity to have the last word for things that were supposed to have been said in your uh, opening close. And if I get the feel that that's going to happen, I'm going to call you on it. And if the judge, as some will, say it better be a rebuttal and you've got everything written out and you're not flexible, uh, it's not going to be pretty. So don't get stuck in a rut. Keep your mind open. Be sensitive to what's going on around you in the courtroom. Don't make your notes a crutch. One of the things that I think most lawyers who have been around for a while will find that you may spend a lot of time preparing outlines uh, of what you're going to say. But when you get up in that courtroom, if you've done your homework, if you know your case, if you prepared those outlines, you're not going to need them. It flows. You're going to find that once you start talking, all those notes in front of you really uh, end up being pretty much useless. Listen, listen, keep your eyes, ears, uh, everything open. And so what happens in terms of this argument about being flexible? Sometimes you're going to be all ready to go when you're open and you're going to be halfway through it and the other side's going to say objection. 
And if you're not flexible, if you're not confident, a lot of times you can get flustered. I got flustered when I was a young lawyer and it happened. And I've learned that you just stop, you take a breath, go up to the bench if you have to, you're going to win, you're going to lose the objection, one or the other, and you go back. And like nothing happened. And you can transition back in front of the jury so they really don't know whether you won or whether you lost. If you won, you can go back and sort of repeat what you said. If you lost, you just transition to another area. But just keep your, your wits about you. You got to be flexible. Flexible, you're going to hear me say this time and time and time again. Get your head uh, up and, pardon the expression, but out of your butt. This is what you got to do. I got this feeling inside my bones. It goes electric, baby, when I turn it on. Off from my city, off from my home. We're flying up, no ceiling when we in our zone. So I don't think there's anything more fun and professionally challenging in a trial. And this goes for the all parts of the trial, but in the closing and opening statements as well. If you're feeling it, and you got to feel it, if you're feeling it when you're making your argument, then you can move about. You can do the shuffle. You can change your tone. When you're looking at that jury and you're not seeing it, and they're not feeling it, you got to be prepared to say to yourself, what can I do to change what I'm doing? It may not be the substance. It may be the flavor. Maybe you, you look them down a little bit harder. Maybe you do something else. But you've got to feel the courtroom. If, you're, if your head is in your notes, you ain't going to be feeling it. And if you ain't feeling it, it's not going to work. Consider, are you constructing a case? Are you building? What's your purpose? Prosecutors generally build. Defense lawyers generally. We are in the business of destructing most of the time. It's always a pleasure when we really have a defense when we have the opportunity to construct. Sometimes it's a combination of constructing and destructing, but you gotta know what it is that you wanna be doing. As I said, surprises. They're gonna happen. When they happen, don't let them see you flinch. We all have stories. I remember when I was a prosecutor and I was prosecuting four people on a, on a bank robbery. The principal eyewitness was supposed to identify the defendant that was sitting uh, to the right of all four defendants. This was a police officer. You would assume he knows who he's supposed to identify in the courtroom. He ends up identifying the individual at the far left of the group of defendants. What do you do? You ask the next question. You don't gulp, you don't gasp, you don't lose your composure, you move on and you try to figure it out the next time. Don't let them see you flinch. If they don't see you flinch, they may not think anything of significance happened. It's the same thing we tell our clients. In the courtroom, don't react. If you react, you're giving emphasis to something that may not be uh, deemed to be important to the jury. So. Those are some initial themes. When we're doing our opening statements and closing arguments, there are what I'll call rules and tools. And we're gonna talk about some of the tools first. When you come to court, be prepared to go to battle. Bring your weapons. You know, we've got a, a pack of stuff that we try to bring in every case. If I'm doing a PowerPoint, it's not just on my laptop. It better be on a thumb drive 
And I might have two or other, two or three other ways of having it back up because sure as you can imagine, half the time there's going to be a technical glitch. Get there early, check it out. In preparing for this presentation, I will tell you, I've gone through it twice with, with Bill from the from the state bar, and it didn't work the first time, and it didn't work the second time. And we had to get it to the point where I knew what I was doing on this new platform. Have your other equipment, a three-hole punch, have notebook paper, not only for you, but for your client, pens for your client, exhibits. These are important things. Have a backup plan for your PowerPoint. If your PowerPoint doesn't work, and sometimes it's just not going to happen. If you're using a PowerPoint, make sure you have it printed in hard copy form. Have it on a have it so that if there's an Elmo in the courtroom, as there are in most, if you have to revert to using your pieces of, of paper in lieu of your PowerPoint, you have a backup plan. If you are like me and you work with a Mac, Macs aren't friendly to all kinds of, of uh, presentation forms, more so now than before. Make sure that you have all the proper connections. Make sure that you have what you need to make things work. This may not seem like something you would expect in a legal argument, but you can't make your presentation effective if you can't make your presentation. So I like to use PowerPoints. I use them a lot. But one thing I learned, um, I think, uh, early on in getting involved in using PowerPoints is that there's sometimes that it's not good to use them. So there are times when a PowerPoint can consolidate and present in one way uh, your, your theme. But I've been involved in a couple of cases that I can recall where we had prepared very extensive PowerPoints to outline for the jury where we were coming from. And then as closing argument came around, uh, we also had a PowerPoint. But I said to myself, look, they've heard all this crap. They've heard it 10 times. They heard it in opening. They heard it through witnesses. They heard it as these exhibits were displayed to them. It's time to move away from the technology and talk to them. And if you need to do something, hold up your exhibit. If you need to have something, dumb it down. Use an easel. Use a, a power uh, of uh, the, um, uh, the easel and a magic marker. Sometimes a magic marker can be as effective as anything. Have one handy and make sure you know where the poster board is. And you can sometimes just revert to that. Now, there are certain standard uh, devices that in my office we use. And my I've gotten on a learning curve because uh, my paralegal, who happens to be my daughter, is my technical uh, guru. And she has gotten me involved in these uh, programs that have been extraordinarily helpful, not just PowerPoint, which is very helpful. We'll get to what they are in a minute. But, you know, for example, in using PowerPoint, you can take a trial exhibit an exhibit that was introduced, take a picture of it from the courtroom, use your phone, use your iPad, and you can then put that into your, uh, your PowerPoint at the end. And then because it's closing argument and not opening statement, you can, you can modify it or you can put things on it to help support your argument. In this case, showing a path that somebody was uh, supposed to have followed during the course of this. Uh, particular event. So they're the exhibits. And if it's a little exhibit like a, you know, three by three by five photograph, and you're showing that in front of the jury, it's not going to be as effective as if you've put it in a PowerPoint and you can blow it up and you can show them exactly what you want and you can add to it. Again, there's a difference between opening and, and closing. In opening, we can't get away with all of this stuff. In closing, it is argument. You're allowed to prove your point. You're allowed to do these things with the exhibits and, and uh, editorialize. And PowerPoint can be very effective for that. Things that may not go back into the jury room. We tried a case recently where uh, the client was accused of distributing fentanyl. And the fentanyl led to somebody's death. And some of the fentanyl was recovered. 
and there was some fentanyl recovered from uh, his location. Now, one of the issues was the fentanyl that he distributed, everybody said was high quality. It was super white, very pure stuff. At the scene of the, the um, individual who died, they recovered some drugs. This is what the client's fentanyl was alleged to look like. The bottom right-hand corner is the, fent is the substance, and it was a combination of fentanyl and other stuff that was recovered. It didn't appear like his fentanyl. There wasn't a direct connect. It was a circumstantial case. And, and frankly, probably the client would have been upset that somebody was accusing him of distributing such poor quality fentanyl. The jury isn't going to see this back in the courtroom, but you can show it to them. You can see the white package. You can see the brown adulterated a substance uh, in the corner. You can put it together with the court's instruction that says, among other things, the jury can look at how the a substance uh, appears. Sometimes you can entertain. You can try to create your point. Here, in this case, there were three individuals who were ne'er-do-wells, whose credibility uh, was easily challenged uh, uh, in each of their own ways. And so as one is arguing their lack of credibility, it's the old three times zero equals zero. There is no value of, you should uh, afford to either one of them individually, uh, and together they don't add up to being anything more than that either. So, use the, 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 the uh, poster board sometimes. Sometimes it's keep it simple, stupid, a and make your point that way. Very simple things. How often have you had to be the one in the courtroom after the other side has a witness describe, this was a residence, there were these bedrooms, there were these uh, other rooms in the, in the residence, and they don't give the jury any perspective. What's the jury going to visualize? Well, you can be the boss. You put up the poster board, you do something very simple by having uh, the witness draw the rooms, and they get a visual, they get context. Very simple stuff. This is not necessarily something that you plan ahead of time. This is where you're being flexible, where you're feeling it in the courtroom. But you got your buddy, that magic marker in your, in your hip pocket or in your purse, and you got the poster board handy, and, and you move uh, and use it when uh, it's helpful. Same thing with other forms of, of, of visual uh, things. Uh, oftentimes, uh, geographical areas, where a house is, where the road is, where the cars were. Let me get this back in order here. Yeah. So, as I said, sometimes the technology is important. So this is, uh, as I mentioned, this is my daughter doing her uh, stuff in the office. Uh, she's the one who puts together the PowerPoint. She's the one that does the downloads of the cell phone dumps. She, she brings out and puts together in a lot of ways uh, the kinds of exhibits we have to deal with now. We don't get like we used to, you know, 30 years ago, just a bunch of photographs. We're getting cell phone digital photographs. We're getting video surveillance. We're getting all kinds of stuff. But these things, uh, they are time consuming, but they are also very valuable. And there are certain very basic uh, tools that are helpful to have. If you don't have a way to capture what's on a screen or on a video, LightShot, which is free, allows you uh, to capture what's on your screen. Snagit is another one. It costs 30 bucks. Now, I will say this for those of you who are on the defense side. Uh, my daughter Amy and I were in May going to put together a program for the MCDAA where she was going to explain to all of us how this stuff can come together in much more detail. And we still plan to do that. So hopefully those of you who are interested will, will join us when we do that. But one of the programs that she came up with, that she came up with, she found that we use regularly is Camtasia. It's an easy program. It's uh, 250 bucks. It's not exorbitant. And it allows you to capture video. It allows you to capture audio. It allows you to edit bits and pieces of things and stitch them together. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to do it. 
So here was a case where there was a street shooting in a Baltimore city. A video camera captures uh, on this right-hand part of the screen, the silver car had our client in it, and an individual had approached him, threatened him, left, came back, approached him again, and at that point, our client opened the door uh, and shot him, and all this was captured on video. But all the prosecutor had was this 20 seconds or so of the, of the video showing the shooting. So we we got six or eight surveillance videos from the various cameras in the neighborhood and uh, Amy went through all of them and, and put together with this Camtasia program, the various bits and pieces. So she got cars that were related to the person who was deceased, sort of traveling through the area, when they showed up, when they left, to show that this wasn't just a random situation. This was a situation where it looked like our client who didn't belong in the neighborhood was in somebody's territory and that person didn't like it. So they came up, threatened him, and then circled back around and came back uh, again. Uh, and when they came back uh, that second time, our guy who uh, was also um, very familiar with the streets was packing and uh, shot that guy before that guy got a chance to shoot him. So uh, at the end of the day, what we had is we had the ability to put together these various uh, surveillance videos to show what was going on at different times. And what you're going to see here in a very sort of quick way is what was done. The surveillance videos were uh, downloaded. Those programs were on uh, Amy's computer. She was able to pull them up, take screenshots of the videos that were important. And then at the end of this process, put the videos side by side so that you could see what was happening at different parts of the neighborhood all uh, together uh, at, you know, at the same time. And this doesn't give real justice to uh, how it works, but the, the, the principle is there. And the, the point is using some of these programs to tell a story in a way that you can't tell in a composite way otherwise, uh, is an an important thing to think about when you're doing it in the appropriate uh, in the appropriate case. So here you can see at the end, these were just an example of her taking two different screen uh, videos and putting them together so they could play together uh, side by side uh, at the same time, and then uh, um, show what was happening in different uh, different parts of uh, uh, of this uh, couple of block area. Uh, during the 15 or 20 minutes that were critical to what happened. So again, back to the opening statement, it rocks. Why is it so important? Ladies and gentlemen, Chelsea Dearden did not kill Victor Tapp. The prosecution has suggested a possible motive, but one based entirely on hearsay, conjecture, and circumstantial evidence. Evidence that on the surface would appear to have some substance, but upon closer examination will prove to have no relevance whatsoever to this case. You're not buying this, are you? You're not listening to a word I'm saying. Really? Right? Well, guess what? I don't blame you. After listening to Mr. Blanchard lay out the prosecution's evidence, even I'm convinced my client murdered Victor Tapp. After all, if I'd walked in the room and found Victor Tapp dead on the floor and Chelsea Dearden's fingerprints all over the weapon that killed him, there isn't much in the world that would convince me that she wasn't guilty. Look, let's just save ourselves a lot of time here. Let's be honest. I'm sure there are a lot better things for us to be doing. Who thinks Chelsea Dearden is guilty? Objection, Your Honor. Mr. Logan. Come on, here, don't hold back. I got my hand raised. Look here. I believe that my client murdered Victor Tapped in cold blood. Isn't everybody convinced? Mr. Logan. Who agrees with me? Come on. I object. Mr. Logan. You're convinced, aren't you? Your Honor. Look, prosecution Honor. says she's guilty. Everybody in the jury says she's guilty. Let's save the state of New York a lot of time and money and move directly to sentencing. <laughs>
Isn't she entitled to a fair trial? Oh, let's give her a fair trial and then convict her. You are totally out of order and you know it. This jury is disqualified. The court will stand on recess while I consider holding you in contempt. Your Honor, I recognize that my opening remarks are highly irregular, but please let me continue. Even though the jury may consider my client guilty at this time, I'd like to state for the record that I still believe in this jury. And I'm willing to accept their final verdict, whatever it might be. I concur, Your Honor. Prosecution is, uh, has equal faith in this jury, Your Honor. May I proceed? Very well, you may proceed, Mr. Lincoln. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. So we all think she's guilty. Now what do we do? Well, that's a dilemma, isn't it? It's an especially difficult problem because we've developed a legal concept in this country to protect ourselves, to protect our rights. And it's called presumption of innocence. In simpler words, that means that one is presumed innocent until proven guilty. And that means that whatever assumptions you might have already made in this case, that Chelsea Dearden must be seen in your eyes, must be believed in your minds, must be understood in your hearts to be innocent. So what is the truth? So this is why it is important to take charge at the beginning of the case and to set your theme. And whether your theme is you're, you're thinking to yourself, I don't have a defense, but I'm just going to raise a reasonable doubt. Educate them on reasonable doubt. Whatever it is, don't default on this opportunity to help create a first uh, impression. Remember, however, that opening statements are statements, they are not argument. And all of us, I'm sure, have gotten in trouble over the years by getting um, ahead of ourselves in arguing uh, rather than stating. And it's not always a, a fine line that you can um, do, but you have to be you know, aware of it and you gotta remember that it is an opening statement, it is a preview, and be careful that you don't overpromise. So there's certain things that are opening statements that are simply not appropriate uh, or smart. So raising expectations and making promises that you can't deliver is not uh, helpful. Uh, try to make certain that if you are giving specifics, you are solid, in your own mind that you're going to be able to prove those things. This is a case, uh, Johnson versus State, where the defense made a number of separate factual assertions, failed to present any of them during the course of the trial, any evidence to support them, and the state was granted a mistrial at the end because of the prejudice in, in making uh, unfulfilled promises in the opening statement. The obvious, prosecutors can't say what a, pro, what a defendant is going to say, whether they're going to say something or not say something, what they're going to tell you. Now, that's a little bit different than saying if you know you've got a statement the defendant made that you're going to play, that you're going to hear his statement, but that's different than the defendant testifying. Opening the door. You go into a trial, you've got a game plan, you've had motions in limine granted, you have the prosecution put in a, a little bit of a box, and then you get crazy in your opening statement and you start saying things that now open the doors that you have closed. My client, you've kept out bad act evidence, you've kept out bad character evidence, and now you start saying to the jury, my guy's a wonderful guy. He's never been in trouble before or, you know, just painting this rosy picture. And now you've opened potentially the door that you so effectively had closed ahead of time. Don't lose track of what you're doing. Don't have the Pyrrhic victory. So everybody does their opening statements differently. I like to go through a, a series of, of stages. One is to just let the jury know procedurally what's going to happen, that the prosecution gets to go first. I got to wait. They get to call the witnesses first. I got to wait to cross-examine. They get to present their case first. Hold your opinion, ladies and gentlemen. We all are, are inclined to form opinions early on. 
let's hold them until the end of this case. Uh, and if you feel like you're starting to form an opinion, say to yourself, this case ain't over. There's two sides to it. Wait. And then go to some of the constitutional principles and talk about the jurors' responsibilities, maybe some special evidentiary considerations. Let them know what the offenses are. If you've spent a lot of time on voir dire, remind them that they said in voir dire that the nature of this horrific child abuse case is not going to affect their ability to be analytical in their analysis, that they've promised to hold the prosecution to the burden of proof. Whatever the issues are in your case, try to hold them, uh, try to first of all highlight those because you're setting the framework, you're setting the themes. Uh, and again, everybody does it differently. Now, beyond a reasonable doubt, educate them. A lot of judges now are going to be giving introductory beyond a reasonable doubt kinds of instructions. Some aren't. This is an important part. I'm going to ask Andy Jessick at the end of this presentation to talk about a case he had in the Court of Appeals that has sort of set the limits as to where we can and cannot go with respect uh, to that uh, a particular issue. If you're in federal court, and you're not a regular there, understand that in this circuit, you're not allowed to argue what reasonable doubt is. The court says to the jury, you gotta be found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, but you're not allowed to explain to them what that is. It's a, it's a bunch of hooey, and most of the trial judges don't like it, but it's what the fourth circuit has told them they have to do. So you repeat, you repeat about presumption of innocence, the constitutional burden that the government has. And what you really want to do is to let the jury be looking to you as the one who has the answers for what's going on in the courtroom, whichever side you're on. You want to educate them. You want to provide the framework. You want to tell them who's who in the case. You want to let them know who's in charge. My jury is good. Sir, excuse for what, sir? I'm asking the fucking questions here, Private. Do you understand? Sir, yes, sir. Well, thank you very much. Can I be in charge for a while? Sir, yes, sir. Are you shook up? Are you nervous? Sir, I am, sir. Do I make you nervous? Sir, sir, what? Are you about to call me an asshole? Sir, no, sir. Well, we want to be in charge, perhaps at a little softer level. But the way you get in charge is you let the jury look to you for the answers. What are the charges? What are the elements? What are they going to have to think about? What are the defenses? Jurors come into courtrooms with common misunderstandings about self-defense or alibi. Whose burden is it? What has to be done? Let them know that the defendant doesn't have a burden in an alibi defense. Discuss special instructions. Eyewitness identification. Talk to them about the fact that eyewitness identification uh, has to be viewed in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more, is that this old idea that eyewitness and, uh, identification is most reliable when a witness is most certain is uh, coming into uh, disrepute. And, and people are realizing that that no longer, no longer is the case, but jurors still are inclined to think that. What's probable? What's improbable? In this particular case, uh, the defense was self-defense, but it was an ugly case. But we had to look through the defendant's eyes to see what he was afraid of and what he was concerned about. And so in the opening statement- Thursday, November 14th, 2013. The time, 14.03. Montgomery County, 911. What's the address of the emergency? Yes, yeah, the camera is white. Right. just assaulted my car with my daughter in it. I tried to defend myself. My car is highly damaged. I'm maybe on the roof of the food court. You have to, you have to the Hello? So, in setting the stage in this case, I wanted the jury to know my client was was scared. He was upset. I wanted them to be able to see the damage to his car. I wanted them to be able to see his little girl that he was afraid of being hurt and to capture all of that. 
and to set that theme early on because what ultimately ended up happening when my client uh, confronted uh, or was confronted by the people who were charged as victims in the case is that there were some very, very ugly uh, stab wounds and knife wounds to the uh, to the alleged victims. And the jury had to understand and put in context early on that there was more to this than just those ugly pictures. If you're going to do a presentation, rehearse it. Make sure it's going to work. Have a backup plan. I talked about this already in terms of, in this case, if I wasn't able to get the PowerPoint to work, I had the text message. I mean, I had the transcript. I would have been able to use that. Talk to them about who the witnesses are, what to evaluate with respect to the witnesses. Explain the defenses. As I said, sometimes jurors don't understand as we do what self-defense means and what the burdens are in those areas. What's the difference between defense of self and defense of others, if anything? What's imperfect self-defense? Looking at your case with 2020 hindsight, and then I'd like to go through, let them know who the players are. You be the one to tell them what the players are. What are their names? What are their nicknames? How do they fit into the case? What they ought to be looking for with respect to the credibility. You want them when this evidence comes out to say, oh, I remember Bonsub telling me this is so-and-so. And that Bonsub said, this is the location where things are going to happen. I have a visual in my mind. I can now see what the issues in this case are going to be. And Bonsib's the boss. He's the guy that told me what I needed to know to have a framework for evaluating uh, what was going to happen in this case. Now, a caution. In opening and in particular, remember, opening in the exhibits you can use, different judges allow different things. Different prosecutors allow, will object to different things. If you're going to be using exhibits if you're going to be using recordings, make sure you understand what the ground rules and what are going to be permitted so that you don't get interrupted in midstream. Eyewitness identification. This is a practice uh, pointer. Uh, I want to move ahead just to this. Our current identification of defendant instruction has this language that says you should also consider the witness's certainty or lack of certainty. This is an issue that Judge Barbera uh, dealt with in her recent case. This is an issue that we need to be challenging whenever the identification instruction is given in order to get cases up before the appellate courts, because it is clear that witness certainty does not translate into witness reliability. And over the years, the less independent evidence a prosecutor has had in an eyewitness identification case, the stronger they have argued about the importance uh, of a witness's certainty. So we need to be constantly working on uh, that particular issue because, as we all know, it has been, over the course of time, one of the greatest sources of wrongful convictions. Closing arguments. Vice Council ready? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, Mr. Foreman, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my name is Arthur Kirkland, and I am the defense counsel for the defendant, Judge Henry T. Fleming. Justice for all. Only we have a problem here. You know what it is? Both sides want to win. We want to win. We want to win regardless of the truth. And we want to win regardless of justice. Regardless of who's guilty or innocent. Winning is everything. <laughs> the prosecution's case, he's got to have one. Not a witness, not one piece of substantiating evidence other than the testimony of the victim herself. One thing 
that bothered me. The one thing that stayed in my mind and I couldn't get rid of it, that haunted me, was why. Why would she lie? What was her motive for lying? If my client is innocent, she's lying. Why? Was it blackmail? No. Was it jealousy? No. Yesterday, I found out why. She doesn't have a motive. You know why? Because she's not lying. And ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the prosecution is not going to get that man today. No. Because I'm going to get him. My client, the Honorable Henry T. Fleming, should go right to fucking jail. The son of a bitch is guilty. So I don't recommend that as uh, uh, the best closing argument, uh, but, uh, you know, it's a fun movie to watch. So we want to be effective. We want to be proper. But there are certain basic uh, rules that uh, we need to follow or not break. And uh, I'm going to run through these last ones uh, kind of quickly. But when you look at Megan's uh, outline, and I recommend that you take the time as you're stuck at home to go through it, because she reviews in detail uh, a lot of the mistakes that are made on both sides of the well of the court uh, in these areas. And, and there are cautions uh, that we need to always remember, and, and particularly on the defense side, we need to remember these rules when they're being violated so that we make the proper record. The golden rule, not placing yourself in somebody else's position. Um, not saving the community or protecting the community by your verdict. Cleaning up the streets. The defendant is a monster, appealing to the prejudice of the jurors. What does a monster look like? Characterization of the defendant as an animal or as a pervert. Arguing facts that are not in evidence. The prosecution arguing that the police officer doesn't get paid more for a conviction. Shifting the burden of proof. I believe the witness. Improper vouching. When it occurs. Opening the door, defense counsel, to the prosecution being able to make arguments. How do you protect yourself in closing argument when you don't want to be uh, viewed as obstructionist by objecting? When there's an improper argument, you've got to object. You may want to argue for an curative instruction. You may have to make the judgment call that a curative instruction isn't going to be helpful and will be more harmful uh, in front of the jury, but then does it waive your objection? Do you make a mistrial? Do you wait until the end of a closing argument before you object? Read the Lawson and Curry cases. Protect the record. Now, is, is Andy back? You got to turn your, hang on for a second. Is Andy there? He, five seconds ago, ran towards the bathroom. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So I'm going to, I'm going to come back to this in just a second. If Andy isn't rejoining us, I was going to ask Andy to talk about uh, this case of his uh, with respect to reasonable doubt. But I'm going to jump ahead for just a minute. Uh, a very interesting case that was just uh, decided uh, is this jury nullification case. We all know that you can't argue jury nullification, but I encourage a read here 
because although the court says you can't tell the jury they can engage in jury nullification, uh, they also cannot be told that they cannot engage in jury nullification. Uh, so, uh, and you can't argue it. It's a, it's a fascinating a case to try to figure out what's going on. Uh, the other thing that I would mention, and then I'm going to shift backwards to, to Andy, is remember one of the worst things for a lawyer is to not have the last word. And as defense counsel, we never get the last word. So I always like to tell the jury before I sit down that I don't get the last word. And I'm asking that they sort of imagine me standing behind the prosecutor when the prosecutor is giving their rebuttal saying, what would Bonsib say if he had an opportunity to come back? Just to give it some context, just to put it in some perspective. So I want to go back to this a reasonable doubt argument and the case that Andy had before the, uh, uh, the Court of, uh, of Appeals in Ingram versus State and let him talk to you about what the court said could and could not be said on the elevator steps, if you will, uh, on uh, leading up to reasonable doubt. So Andy, I'm going to let you take it over. Thank you, Bob. Dexter Ingram versus State was a jury trial before Judge Roop in Montgomery County Circuit Court around 2011. And we had a board that showed the jury all the levels of proof from suspicion all the way up to beyond a reasonable doubt. The state made an objection, it was Jeff Winter. And the judge, after a lot of argument says, I'll let you argue the top three. So he didn't let us argue tie in the middle, but he let us argue preponderance and clear and convincing to contrast it to beyond a reasonable doubt. And in the Court of Appeals, we argued that we should have been allowed to argue the bottom half of the spectrum. And the Court of Appeals simply up affirmed the conviction, not necessarily saying that the bottom half is forever forbidden. The Court of Appeals just simply said the judge has wide discretion. And the result of that opinion the result of that opinion in practice, at least in my experience, is that now prosecutors generally are not objecting when we simply argue the top half of the probability spectrum, preponderance, clear and convincing, and beyond a reasonable doubt. In fact, I've never had a prosecutor object since Ingram, and I've never had a judge uh, sustain or indicate that the judge would not allow it. So I think also the next step is that we can still try to argue the bottom half because there's nothing in Ingram which forbids the trial judge from allowing defense attorneys to argue suspicion all the way up to 50-50. So I think in any case, you should at least use the top half in every case and in every case try to use the bottom half as well. Thanks, Andy. And I think it's important what you just said. The, the case, as I understood it, was decided on an abuse of discretion sort of standard it didn't say that you couldn't argue it. It said the judge did not abuse his discretion in prohibiting you from arguing it, correct? That's correct. All right, thank you. But, but there's also nothing in the opinion that criticizes in any way using the top three, preponderance, clear and convincing, and beyond a reasonable doubt. So if anybody has a judge ever questioning whether we should be arguing other standards of proof that apply to civil cases, just simply say Ingram doesn't give any implicit criticism whatsoever of what Judge Roof allowed me to do in that trial. The Thank you. Top hat. So in conclusion here, um, we get to the last part of this. Um, regardless of what side we are on, whether prosecutor or defense lawyer, our clients need us. They're gonna call us when they're in trouble and we need to be there for them. So that's us. We're the Ghostbusters. We're the, we're the charging, uh, we're the charging horses, we're the, the whites, the knights in, in uh, shining armor with the white hats. And this is a fun profession. It's serious stuff. 
uh, but it's also fun. And I and I would only uh, sort of end with this. And sometimes we all need reminders that no matter how hard the trial, uh, we are part of a, of a noble and an important profession that doesn't always get it right. But the best chance of it getting right is when two good advocates uh, come together and make uh, make the system, challenge the system to try to get it right. We can do that. We can do it aggressively. We can do it vigorously. We can also do it with civility. So I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be with you all this afternoon. Everyone be safe, and I'll turn it over to Andy. Thanks. Hi, Bob. Thanks so much. Um, this is Erica Suter. I'm a member of the Education Committee of the Criminal Law Section Council. I have the pleasure of introducing Andy, our next speaker. We all just got a preview of Andy. Um, Andy Jezik is going to speak to us about the law of confessions. Many of us know Andy. He is a former prosecutor and now leads um, his own firm, Jezik and Moise. He's the consummate trial attorney. He's handled over 110 jury trials and 60 homicide cases. He's a fellow in the American College of Trial Lawyers. He's a member of the Maryland Criminal Pattern Jury Instruction Committee. He's the immediate past president of the Maryland uh, Criminal Defense Attorneys Association, where he's launched various new initiatives, including an MCDA judicial nominating committee for every county and the city and the appellate courts, a, legis a legislative committee and an amicus committee. And of course, he is the co-author of the Maryland Law of Confessions, which is now in its 16th edition, along with his co-authors, Frank Maloney, Judge Patrick Woodard, and Judge Kathy Grafe. Thanks very much, Andy. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Erica. And Bob, thank you for that great presentation. Um, I don't have the graphics that Bob Bonsum has uh, because the area of confession law is somewhat academic, so please stay with me. But we do have a PowerPoint. And also, we had provided, I think, a 29-page outline uh, that covers most of the main topics in confession law around the state. Uh, but before I go, I, I can't, before I start, I can't help but comment on uh, Bob and his presentation. Uh, and Bob, Bob, if anybody gets a chance to see Bob Bonsup in trial, it's quite amazing. Uh, I had a jury trial recently where uh, it was a hung jury, eight to four for guilt. Bob took over the second time. And after he cross-examined the victim in that case, the state walked out, talked to its supervisors, came back in and null crossed the case in front of the jury because of Bob's cross-examination. Quite an amazing accomplishment. All right, so the first thing I'd like to talk about here is the uh, right to silence. There was a groundbreaking case from the Supreme Court in 2010 called Berguis versus Tompkins. And if you really want to get your blood boiling, if you're a defense attorney, uh, read the dissent because it, this majority opinion five to four was truly astonishing. Essentially what the five justice majority ruled in Berguis versus Tompkins is that in order to invoke the right to silence after you've been told by the police that you have a right to silence, the only way to invoke the right to silence is not simply to remain silent. You must actually unequivocally say to the police, I don't want to talk to you. So Berguis was very significant in that sense that for the first time, number one, the Supreme Court required the unequivocal standard for invocation of counsel to be applied to invocation of silence. Number two, the Supreme Court ruled that there is this, in, in this particular case, the defendant who remains silent for two and a half hours after Miranda rights were read and the police were simply giving him a speech for two and a half hours. And of course, this interrogation was not recorded. That by 
choosing to speak finally at the end of that two and a half hour period of silence, that that was an implicit waiver of the right to silence under Miranda, which is astonishing. And so the, the defendant chose to remain silent for two and a half hours, yet that was not enough to invoke his right to silence. And of course, the four justice dissent went bananas about that. And Justice Sotomayor said, advising a suspect that he has a right to remain silent is unlikely to convey that he must speak and must do so in some particular fashion to ensure the right will be protected. Now, the other point of number two here uh, is Tompkins appeared to overrule the holding of the Court of Special Appeals in Freeman versus State, which had held, and this is very important, that the unambiguous David standard for invoking the right to counsel does not apply to pre-waiver invocations. Let me repeat that. In Freeman versus State, Back in 2004, the Court of Special Appeals held that the unambiguous standard of Davis for invocation of counsel does not apply to a pre-Miranda waiver situation. So in other words, if somebody just simply comes into the interrogation room and the detective says, hi, and the defendant says, by the way, I want a lawyer, or he says something more ambiguous, by the way, I might want to speak to my lawyer, and the Miranda rights have not yet been read, then Freeman said that that might be sufficient for an invocation, even though it's not unambiguous, because the Miranda waiver has not been gotten yet. And Freeman was not a radical decision. That was approaching the majority in the country at the time. And the reason for that is that the Supreme Court in the case above it, in number one there on the screen, in Davis versus the United States, had held that the unequivocal standard applies only to post-waiver situations. So Freeman was simply the logical extension of Davis versus the United States. Now, Tompkins arguably overruled Freeman. And unfortunately, it wasn't clear until Williams versus State in 2015. Williams versus State was a murder in College Park. It was handled by, I believe, Bill Brennan and uh, John McKenna. And it was a, a tragic case. Judge Surrett was the trial attorney in Prince George's County. And it was a real close call. And the Court of Appeals, or the Court of Special Appeals in Williams, essentially held the opposite of Freeman, that there is no difference in the invocation standard pre-waiver and post-waiver. And then the Court of Appeals, when they took up the case, essentially said the same thing, although it wasn't quite as clear. So the whole point here for the practitioners out there is that if you come across an indication of the right to silence or uh, an indication of the right to counsel, which is ambiguous and does not meet that unambiguous standard. If that ambiguous indication is done pre-waiver, we as defense attorneys should argue that the Supreme Court has never affirmatively overturned Davis. In other words, that the pre-waiver invocation standard does not need to be unambiguous. And I think obviously the, the trial court is going to rule against you because the first Williams case uh, and a couple other cases in the Court of Special Appeals has held that uh, Freeman should be overruled. But the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals has never explicitly said so. So I think that's an avenue for all of us to try to get around this unambiguous indication standard of uh, the right to counsel and the right to silence. The third 
Interesting aspect of Bergwies versus Tompkins is number three here. A statement from the defendant showing an implied waiver is not necessary to interrogate. Uh, in other words, the Supreme Court said after giving a Miranda warning, police may interrogate a suspect who has neither invoked nor waived his or her Miranda rights. And that's what we were talking about earlier is that there is no explicit requirement from the Supreme Court and now from our Court of Appeals where the defendant must explicitly say, I agree now to speak to you. I agree now that I don't need a lawyer. All that is needed is that the rights are validly read, number one, that the state can prove that the defendant's understanding of the Miranda rights uh, happened by a preponderance of the evidence that he understood those rights. And number three, that knowing those rights, the defendant chose to speak. And that's very bad for us as defense attorneys, uh, but that's the very clear law of the land now with respect to waivers. So it's my understanding that perhaps there's a uh, method here for questions to come up on the screen. If anybody has any questions or comments or suggestions, you know, I think that it would encourage those so we could uh, talk a little bit more in detail about these issues. We go to the next screen. Now we're skipping around a little bit here, but I wanted to get and I just gave such a, a dark and dismal sort of introduction there about the law of uh, waiver and invocation uh, for, for at least from the defense attorney's perspective. Uh, I wanted to jump to something very positive uh, for the defense attorneys, and that is comes from a very unusual source. Judge Charlie Moylan, uh, in his fascinating opinion in 2013, in Ray Darrell P., um, gave us as defense attorneys two gems to argue when the interrogation is done in the Sixth Amendment territory. This is a uh, case out of Prince George's County uh, that went up to the Court of Special Appeals and Judge Moylan uh, and the Court of Special Appeals reversed the conviction for several reasons, one of which was a violation of the defendant's Sixth Amendment right. So before we get into what George Moylan said, just as some background, some very basic background, the Sixth Amendment rules with respect to waiver and interrogation are different in some respects than the Fifth Amendment Miranda rules. But first, in order to get to the more defendant-friendly rules with respect to Sixth Amendment waiver, We've got to be in the Sixth Amendment territory. And the Sixth Amendment is defined by the Supreme Court as the point at which interrogation takes place after, any time after, the defendant appears before the commissioner and is advised of the charges and the right to counsel. Supreme Court has held that. So if there is an interrogation, at least for a felony case, that occurs after presentment to the commissioner, we are in Sixth Amendment territory. And the defendant has more protections in the Sixth Amendment. One of the protections in the Sixth Amendment, which is greater, is that custody is not a requirement for the detective to be forced to read the defendant the Miranda rights. In other words, the detective must read the defendant Miranda rights with a Sixth Amendment interrogation, whether or not the defendant is in custody. Custody is irrelevant to the Sixth Amendment. But what Judge Moylan has established here in In Re Darrell P is actually a case that is unique across the country. No other case, as far as I'm concerned, at least as of 2019, has ruled as defendant friendly as Judge Moylan did in this case. And what Judge Moylan said is, is we num number one, the defendant had the right to have the fact of his indictment communicated to his lawyer. 
if not to himself, a full month before he was subjected to uncounseled interrogation. So basically what the uh, what Judge Moylan ruled in general is that we're in the Sixth Amendment territory. The detectives need to tell the defendant not just the four Miranda rights. You have a right to silence. You have a right to counsel. You have a right to appointed counsel. And you have, anything you say can be used against you. But you have a Fifth Amendment right in the Sixth Amendment context, which is that the detective has to at least tell you or the lawyer or both in some circumstances uh, as a defendant what he's charged with. So it's not just an indictment that the detective needs to tell to the defendant, because oftentimes we're in Sixth Amendment territory and still a statement of charges. It's not even an indictment yet. Because remember, the Supreme Court has ruled that the Sixth Amendment begins once the defendant is presented to the commissioner and is read the charges and advised of the right to lawyer. So just to sum it all up, Judge Moylan said you, the police need a fifth Miranda right you need to tell the defendant in the Sixth Amendment territory the charges. The second thing that's better about the Sixth Amendment right to counsel waiver is number two here on the screen in the PowerPoint, and that is that the Sixth Amendment waiver must be expressed, which is very different from what we just talked about in Bergwies v. Tompkins in the Fifth Amendment context, where the waiver of the Miranda rights can be virtually just the act of speaking two and a half hours later. So in the Sixth Amendment, Judge Moylan said, quote, there, the court held that the broader Sixth Amendment product protection of counsel as a necessary medium between the appellant and the state is not vulnerable to a waiver by inference from merely informed silence or from merely the act of confessing itself after having been given the Miranda rights. In other words, in the Sixth Amendment context, the defendant has to explicitly say, I understand this and I agree to talk to you. And I think that is a very significant development. Now, unfortunately, these gems that Judge Moylan has given us are not going to be utilizable that often because there aren't too many interrogations in the Sixth Amendment context. However, just keep in mind, a lot of people think that the Sixth Amendment begins once there's an indictment or an information that has been filed. And that is simply not the case. The Supreme Court ruled uh, in the early uh, 2000, around 2011, in a Texas case, uh, 1983 case, that uh, the Sixth Amendment begins upon presentment to the commissioner. So can we see the next screen now, please? All right. Going back to where we started on the first screen, going back to Miranda waiver, you know, there's a seminal case for almost any issue that you have in court that you should never have outside of your briefcase. And this is that case, Gonzalez versus State. If you have a waiver issue, bring Gonzalez versus State. It is a very surprising holding. It was a four to three case. Uh, and I'll go through the very basics, which I don't have here on the uh, PowerPoint. Gonzalez versus State was an Eastern Shore prosecution of, of a murder where the defendant was uh, from a remote area of Mexico where he spoke very little Spanish, but his primary language was Mistec. And the waiver portion of the interrogation was unrecorded. And the detectives brought in, they didn't have a Mistec interpreter available, imagine that. So they brought in the defendant's sister when the defendant indicated that he had some problems understood, understanding the Spanish word for attorney and understanding the Spanish word for court. And the sister was the one that gave the detective the mistech word for attorney and gave the detective the mistech word for court. And the detective, again, this was unrecorded, repeated the mistech word for attorney in court to the defendant. And then at the, and this is unrecorded, and at the confession suppression hearing, the detective simply testified about all of this. And he testified, I got the mistech word, I wrote it down on a piece of paper, I threw that piece of paper out, but whatever that sister told me the mistech word was, the defendant seemed to understand what attorney and court meant. And when I said it, 
I could just tell from the way he looked that he seemed to understand it. Now I'm simplifying things, but the sister was not called as a witness. The defendant did not take the stand, unfortunately, and there was no recording. And you can understand why the Court of Appeals was very divided on this issue. And they ruled that the issue of waiver, although it is the state's burden preponderance to the proponents of the evidence to show that the defendant both knew and understood the Miranda rights, and number two, that the waiver was voluntary, and that's a high burden, high burden is often used, even though it's the preponderance of the evidence for waiver. The Court of Appeals held that waiver can be evidenced by a totality of the circumstances. And because the trial court himself had listened to the whole con uh, confession after that, which was recorded and which was in Spanish, and the Court of Appeals listened to it as well, they felt that the trial judge's ruling took in all the consideration, believed the officer, that the officer was very credible, and there was no indication that the defendant, who didn't speak Spanish very well, did not understand the mistech um, translation of attorney in court. And so although this is a very bad case for a defense attorney, for those prosecutors who are listening to this, uh, this is the case you want, obviously, every single time you walk into court for waiver. But it's so fact intensive that the defense attorneys obviously will find something in here that is distinguishable. So uh, if you want to, again, I started off by saying if you're, if you're a defense attorney, and you want to see which way the courts are moving in terms of being more pro-defendant or more pro-prosecution. Uh, clearly from the Supreme Court, it's moving toward pro-prosecution. And in some ways, from time to time, the Court of Appeals is moving toward pro-prosecution with respect to Miranda issues. Uh, read Gonzalez versus State as Exhibit A about how the Court of Appeals from time to time is more pro-prosecution with um, Miranda waiver issues. Now, moving to the other side right away, here number one in the uh, PowerPoint, moving from pro-prosecution with Gonzalez versus State to pro-defense in Luckett versus State, if you want to have the greatest case ever written that I've ever read uh, for the defense for waiver of Miranda, not the Sixth Amendment, but Miranda, then read Luckett versus State. It's written by Chief Judge Barbera. I don't think she was Chief Judge when she wrote this, but here is the key part that we bring to a, probably about a third of our confession suppression memos. And that is what's written here, number one. If the Miranda warnings viewed in totality, in any way, in any way, mistake the suspect's right to silence and counsel, or mislead, or confuse the suspect with respect to those rights. And again, we argue in any way modifies both misstate, mislead, and confuse uh, as much as it modifies misstate. Uh, and for that reason, in any way, they just need any kind of express confusion created by the detective on the defendant with respect to any part of the Miranda rights, then according to this passage in Luckett, we have a chance in the trial court to get the confession suppressed as violative of Miranda. And she continues, uh, Judge Barbera, then the warnings are constitutionally infirm, rendering any purported waiver of those rights constitutionally defective and requiring suppression of any subsequent statement. So always take luck in your briefcase when you have a confession suppression hearing. And also when you're looking at a video of the confession or statement of your client, you want to look at any part of the confession, any part. It's not just pre-waiver or during the waiver period, but post-waiver. If there is any statement that 
somehow denigrates or downplays or misrepresents or misdirects or misstates any part of the Miranda rights, then Luckett does say that any statement after that affirmative deception or misstatement, wherever it is in the interrogation, will cause the rest to be suppressed. So in other words, the issue of waiver of Miranda is not something that is static in time to just the waiver period. It is an ongoing analysis throughout the entire interrogation. So if you have a very clean waiver, the defendant starts talking, and then at some point there is a misstatement related to counsel. You know, the defendant says something like, you know, I'm getting a little nervous here. What do you think? Do you think I need a lawyer here? And the, the detective invariably will say something like, well, you of course have a right to a lawyer, but if you bring a lawyer in, you know, you're going to not have that fabulous opportunity to tell your side of the story before I speak to the co-defendant, and that's going to be potentially bad for you or something like that. If the, de the detective says something like that in minute 45 of the interrogation, then anything after that should be suppressed according to Luckett. And the Court of Appeals said as, says as such in Luckett. So moving on to the next case that is very pro-defendant. Oh, can we go back? Would you mind to the... Uh, thank you. Number two at the bottom of the slide here with respect to Miranda waiver is, again, authored by uh, Judge Barbera in 2011, Lee versus State. It's a Baltimore County uh, prosecution for murder. And there was a statement at some point in the interrogation where I believe the detective said something like, this is just between me and you, bud, or something like that, indicating that whatever the defendant said will not be used in court, implying that. And uh, the Court of Appeals held that sure enough was a misrepresentation under the very pro-defendant Luckett standard and ruled that the waiver was invalid. Now, one of the some of the things that the Lee court made clear about this very pro-defendant Luckett standard is A, to A, the defendant need not rely on the misrepresentation. In other words, the defense has no burden to show that the defendant actually heard or even relied on that misrepresentation as long as it was said to him. Number two, the misrepresentation can occur after the waiver. We already talked about that. And number three, the good faith of the detective is irrelevant. What if it was just a slip of the tongue, but it was just the, the most unfortunate thing the detective ever said in his career, and he was a fabulous detective otherwise? That is absolutely irrelevant. And one of the other interesting things in Lee is that the Court of Appeals, although they reversed because there was a Miranda violation, the Court of Appeals did not rule that that statement that the detective made, this is just between me and you, but the Court of Appeals ruled that that was not an improper promise that would make the subsequent statement involuntary. And that was a big surprise. And actually the two judge dissent, it was probably the most unusual two dissent, judge dissent in terms of the, the, the uh, where these judges are usually in terms of pro-defense, pro-state, Judge Chief Judge Bell and Judge Joe Murphy were in the dissent together saying, no, 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 that was an improper promise that should have rendered the subsequent statement uh, involuntary. This is, don't worry, this is just between me and you. Uh, and the Court of Appeals didn't want to go that far to rule that that was an improper promise to make the subsequent statement involuntary. Uh, but nonetheless, it's still a very pro-defendant and very good uh, opinion, um, Lee versus State. And I would just like to point out, it's kind of a good diversion here. When the circuit court rules that, or the court, suppression court rules that a statement is involuntary, excuse me, a waiver is involuntary, that simply means that it's a Miranda violation. 
and the state is then, as long as the statement is voluntary, can use the subsequent statement to cross-examine a testifying defendant. So if a Miranda waiver is involuntary or unknowing, then it's simply a Miranda violation. And the prosecution can use the suppressed statement to cross-examine a testifying defendant. And the reason that the Lee versus State so, was so important for remand for the second trial was because the majority didn't rule or ruled that the statement was voluntary. So if Mr. Lee was going to take the stand in the subsequent prosecution, then despite the fact that it was a Miranda violation and an involuntary or unknowing waiver, the state could cross-examine Mr. Lee if he took the stand. If the court rules that the statement itself is involuntary, not the waiver, but if the statement itself is involuntary, whether it be under the common law rule or under the due process test, and we'll go get to those two distinctions later, that means that the prosecutor is not allowed to use that subsequent statement to cross-examine the testifying defendant. And also, an involuntary statement also it renders subsequent physical evidence found to be in almost all circumstances inadmissible. There's still a uh, dissipation of the fruit analysis that eventually attaches after an involuntary statement, but the case law nationwide makes the exclusionary rule following an involuntary statement to be one of the strongest exclusionary rules in the entire criminal law. It's like a bulldozer. Perhaps the only other um, exclusionary rule which is uh, more uh, powerful than the um, exclusionary rule attached to involuntary statements is the exclusionary rule after a Fifth Amendment violation. So um, I understand there are some questions here and I'm going to try to uh, pull those up. Bill, are you able to help me pull those up? Yeah, if you just click on the uh, little comments thing at the top of your uh, top right of your screen, that looks like a dialog box. Okay, got it. And then you click on the link, the docs. Uh huh. It should it should open up the questions for you. All right. Uh, so I think there's some stuff from Bob's in there, and if yep. you just scroll down, I think the first one for you will either be the "What's the law on using exhibits," which I think was for Bob actually, okay. but then there's one for what. Wasn't there a Fourth Circuit case regarding invocation of Miranda rights? Okay. Now, I think I've gotten uh, uh, the, my screen's messed up. But uh, can you read the first question to me? Sure. The question you have here is, wasn't there a Fourth Circuit case regarding the invocation of Miranda rights, or has that now been memorialized in the Supreme Court case you referred to? I'm not sure what slide you were on when that was posted exactly. You know, I'm not familiar with the Fourth Circuit case that went to the Supreme Court, uh, but there, there is, to my knowledge, there are only uh, two major invocation cases that have gone to the Supreme Court in the last uh, 25 years. One is Davis in 94 that set the standard, and then Berguis, uh is the one we talked about on the first slide. So I'm still having some issues getting back to where I was. Um, do you mind reading the second one? The only other question we had um, was, uh, what is the law for using exhibits in opening? There's one other question. Why not argue that the top three, they're talking about reasonable doubt, are something more other than the bottom? This is from Robert Cohen of the OPD. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You, you want to argue the bottom, uh, you know, if, if you're not afraid of an uh, objection uh, in the middle of your closing, then certainly you can go for it because it's up. The judge will rule right then and there. Um, but uh, OK, are there any other questions with respect to um, the confession portion? No. OK. All right. Can we move on to the next slide, please.
All right. So going back to indication, uh, the Court of Appeals in Ballard uh, confronted the issue of what constitutes an unequivocal indication, and this was a very favorable case to the defense. Uh, the quote was, you mind if I not say no more and just talk to an attorney about this? And the Court of Appeals ruled that that was an indication. Uh, so they simply just said, the court, in the last sentence here, the court found that Ballard used a deferential colloquial way of stating a desire for an attorney. Now, what's interesting in Ballard, to go back to what we talked about earlier, is Ballard repeated, repeated the Davis Supreme Court standard in its opinion that the unequivocal indication standard only applies to the post-waiver context. All right, and then the second paragraph here, in contrast to this, this Court of Appeals held in that Prince George's County case that uh, Bill Brennan and John McKenna handled uh, in Williams, uh, where the defendant said, I don't want to say nothing, I don't know. The court held four to three that that was insufficient to constitute an indication of the right to silence. Now, the other Court of Appeals case that has come out recently on indication is Gupta. It's a Montgomery County prosecution. Phil Armstrong handled it for the defense, along with Jenny Page. And um, <clears throat> Pat Mays handled it for the uh, state. And uh, it was Judge Jordan. And Judge Jordan held in Montgomery County that the indication in a holding cell was not operable because interrogation was not imminent. So that's just an argument that you need to be aware of, uh, at least the prosecutors here that are listening, is whenever there is an indication that is not in the interrogation room, you can make a colorful, a, a colorable, excuse me, argument that the indication is not valid and not operable because interrogation is not imminent. Right. You mind going to the next screen? All right. The issue of reinitiation after Miranda invocation. Uh, the Court of Appeals in Philip uh, addressed what, if anything, the police can say to a defendant after he invokes his right to an attorney during interrogation. The lead detective told the defendant that his indication of counsel meant they couldn't talk about the case. But as he was leaving, if he decided he wanted to talk and wanted to tell a story, he could do that. Court of Appeals said it was a close call, but nonetheless, it was an improper reinitiation of the interrogation. So essentially, I think what we all know from basic law school classes on this is that once there is an invocation of the right to counsel or an invocation of the right to silence, the law is that the police must stop and must leave, or not leave, but must stop interrogating and anything arguably innocuous like this to try to encourage the defendant to change the defendant's mind will probably be held to be an improper interrogation after an interrogation. And any subsequent waiver or any subsequent statement, even though the defendant then says, hey, okay, I changed my mind, I wanna to talk to you, will be held to be uh, inadmissible under Miranda. Again, not involuntary, but a violation of Miranda. Now, we don't have this on the screen, but I'll just say, uh, I think what a lot of people already know, there is a difference in the reinitiation standards with respect to the right to silence and the right to counsel. A Supreme Court case from 1975, Michigan versus Mosley, set out the standards for the police after a defendant validly invokes silence. That is, the police should wait a period of time, and then the police are allowed to come back in. And actually, they're allowed to, under some circumstances, attempt to get a waiver, even after an invocation of silence. Now, in order for that to be valid, it certainly helps that new detectives come in, that the interrogation be done in a different place, and the pause after the invocation be somewhere around at least an hour or two or more. That's a very fact-specific inquiry, and courts have gone both ways. But if you do those three things, the new interrogator, new interrogation room, wait two hours, 
honor silence by leaving and not interrogating right away, the Supreme Court has held that the subsequent Miranda waiver after that indication of silence might be valid. And the rules for right to counsel indication are completely different. Once there is an indication of the right to counsel, then, and it's valid, there must be a cessation of interrogation right away. And as long as the defendant as it is in custody for the duration of his case, then there cannot be any police initiated interrogation on any subject, even a new case, as long as the defendant remains incarcerated uh, pre-trial and then a 14-day period after uh, the defendant is shipped off to DOC, which is another complicated topic we won't get into. But the bottom line is, there's a case from one of the circuit courts that says, an invocation of counsel is like the ever ready bunny. It just keeps going and going and going. And that's true. An invocation of counsel while in custody, as long as the defendant stays in custody, is valid for a very long time. Say, suffice it to say the duration of the case in a little bit more. Right. Do you mind if we go on to the next uh, screen? Now look at some uh, text messages here. All right. Um, custody. Um, again, if, if you have a custody case, the case you want in your briefcase, in your in your uh, quiver, is Thomas versus State. And it was such a close case, it could have gone either way. This was a case in uh, Montgomery County. Judge Eric Johnson was the trial judge. Um, and it was a sex offense case. And it was a 90 minute interrogation where it was essentially a P had all the trappings of a, a non custodial interrogation. The defendant drove himself to the interrogation. The defendant was told at the beginning of the interrogation that this was about uh, an allegation that the detectives had heard his daughter make about him having sexually abused his own daughter. Uh, the detectives told him uh, that he was not under arrest at the beginning of the interrogation and that the interrogation door was unlocked. And then on the custody side, one of the two detectives sat between the detect the defendant and the door. He was not told that he was free to go. Miranda was never read to him. And the detectives told him early on, as I mentioned, that his daughter had disclosed that he had sexually abused her. In the end, both the Court of Special Appeals and the Court of Appeals upheld Judge Johnson's ruling that there was no custody. And he was arrested maybe about eight minutes after the end of the interrogation. And the, the key part of Thomas, which makes it a very unique case nationwide, is that the court was confronted with the issue of whether or not the first confession in an otherwise non-custodial interrogation constitutes a radical change in the custodial environment and converts a non-custodial interrogation to a custodial interrogation. In other words, did the confession make a huge difference? And the Court of Appeals ruled that looking at the videotape, that the defendant confessing in the first 20 minutes or so of this 90 minute, very polite interrogation did not alter the overall coercive and custodial atmosphere of the situation. And that the defendant hearing himself say, I sexually abused my own daughter did not in and of itself convert the situation into a custodial interrogation whereby Miranda would be immediately necessary after the first confession. As a matter of fact, he went on to give great detail after that about how he had sexually abused his daughter. And at no time during that 90 minute interrogation did the Court of Appeals rule that Miranda should have been read because those non-custodial aspects of the interrogation that we mentioned here and others maintain themselves throughout the interrogation. 
So again, if you have a uh, custody case, you want to bring Thomas with you to the table because it outlined both the dissent and the um, majority outline all the factors extremely well. Um, and in our book, uh, Judge Grave was the author of the Court of Special Appeals opinion in Thomas. And in our book, uh, there's a list of about 40 or so custody factors that you can argue one way or the other when you have your confession suppression here. Mind if we go to the next slide? Uh, these are just the list of other cases that you want to bring. Uh, I figure I want to balance things out here. You know, Thomas is very pro-state in general, uh, but there are some very positive cases uh, on custody. Aguilar Tovar versus State is uh, a particularly pro-defendant ruling. I'll just tell you really quick. Um, Karen Carvajal was the outstanding interrogator in this case in Montgomery County, another sex offense case, one of the best interrogators I've ever seen in my life. And she repeatedly told the defendant that he had failed the polygraph, and that indicated to her nearly 100% that that means he was guilty and he was lying, that he had sexually abused his daughter. And the Court of Special Appeals, two months after Thomas was came down from the Court of Appeals, that pro-state case, the Court of Special Appeals held Chief Judge Krauser that at some point during that interrogation, it became so intense and the repetition on the you failed the polygraph, so you must be guilty repetition and cadence was so overwhelming that it changed the overall atmosphere among the 40 other factors in the custody analysis to a custodial interrogation and Miranda should have been given and that case was reversed. Buck versus State. There's another case that Bill Brennan and uh, John McKenna handled, a Prince George's County case out of a uh, murder case where, and this is very significant, Buck versus State for the defense. In this case, <clears throat> Judge Eiler, Judge Debbie Eiler, wrote the opinion essentially saying that even though the police had repeatedly told the defendant that he was not under arrest, that the circumstances were so custodial incident to the police driving the defendant to the station and the interrogation that the circumstances belied the detective's previous representations to the defendant that he was not under arrest. Um, Erica, you have a question? It wasn't my question that came up in the document. Uh, somebody asked, can you briefly discuss post-confession Miranda when police interrogate and then get a confession, then Mirandize and re-interrogate? The question just came in. Can you, can you repeat that again? I'm sorry. Can you briefly discuss post-confession Miranda when police interrogate and get a confession, then Mirandize and re-interrogate? Yeah, we've got that a little later, I believe, in the, the outline and um, be happy to get there. That's Missouri v. Siebert. The two-step method, the way I understand the question. Um, so anyway, Bond versus State, excuse me, Buck versus State, a very favorable case for the defense. Uh, Bond versus State, a Hartford County prosecution, very favorable. Uh, and Robinson versus State, a, a Baltimore City prosecution, Judge Murphy uh, wrote that, very, very favorable for custody uh, and the defense. We have the next slide, please. All right, this, this is the, the question itself. So uh, Missouri v. Siebert is that famous Supreme Court case that was 4-4-1, and the one in the concurrence was Justice Kennedy, and virtually all courts have ruled that the one, Justice Kennedy's concurrence, is the holding of the case. And essentially what Justice Kennedy said is if the police deliberately question the defendant in a custodial situation, before Miranda is read. And then sometime later, get a Miranda waiver and in some way refer back or make in some way related the interrogation to what was said to the prior unworn interrogation. Even if the unworn statement is suppressed, in some circumstances, the subsequent statement 
will be admissible, even though there was this prior unworn statement. Uh, but in this particular case, because the unworn statement, which was suppressed, was shown to be related to the second statement taken after Miranda, and there was not a sufficient time between the two statements, and the first interrogation was deliberately done to get a statement from the defendant without the benefit of Miranda, the Supreme Court ruled that that statement should be suppressed. So there's a lot of information there that I just gave, but the real short of it is at a motion to suppress, it is the defense's burden to show that the uh, there was some pre-Miranda interrogation. And then we must ask the trial court to make a factual finding that the first statement of the defendant, uh, the first interrogation of the detective was purposefully done to get around Miranda. In other words, it was in bad faith. If the circuit court makes the factual finding that it was a purposeful Miranda violation and there's not a sufficient time that passes and there's a relation between the second statement after Miranda and the first unworn statement, then the statement should be suppressed. So again, the circuit court needs to find that the first uh, interrogation was done in bad faith. And if so, if there's a relation and not sufficient time uh, passes after the subsequent Miranda waiver and subsequent statement, the statement should be suppressed. Now, a lot of times what I think defense attorneys don't argue is they don't insist that the court make that factual finding. And the court, under Justice Kennedy's concurrence, must make that factual finding. Uh, the four justice plurality didn't require a purposeful Miranda violation. And then the four justice dissent essentially said, this is no problem whatsoever. The Miranda waiver cured it all. Uh, so moving on, uh, Rush versus State is a Prince George's County prosecution that Barry Helfand and Dave Martella handled. And it, there was a lot of preliminary discussion in the interrogation room with the defendant, but it wasn't really about the event itself. But some of the things that the defendant said in the first 10 minutes or so of an unwarned interrogation were used later by the prosecution, or at least were used later in the subsequent state. And the Court of Appeals ruled that because this first 10 minutes of basic kind of friendly talk about the defendant, even though it was unwarned, wasn't really that incriminating. It was just kind of laying the groundwork and establishing rapport that it was not sufficiently the type of bad faith uh, interrogation that triggers this Missouri v. Siebert exclusionary rule. And just to jump back to it, one of the reasons that Missouri v. Siebert is so important to uh, defense attorneys is that normally when there's a Miranda violation that's not purposeful, then a subsequent statement after that is almost always going to come into evidence if there's a good Miranda violation. But Missouri v. Siebert finally said, no, 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 there is an exclusionary rule that is attaches to subsequent statements uh, after an unwarned interrogation. Now, Bobby v. Dixon is a, is a Supreme Court case that was very pro-state, and it really waters down um, Missouri v. Siebert in, in a significant way. Bobby V. Dixon was a murder prosecution where the um, initial statements obtained by the defendant without the benefit of Miranda warnings were considered not to be incriminating. And therefore, the subsequent statement that was admitted in the evidence after a Miranda waiver was admissible. I mean, the subsequent statement after Miranda was admissible because the first statement was not sufficiently incriminating and therefore could not have too much of a causal connection between the subsequent Mirandai statement. So Bobby B. Dixon is a very important case for prosecutors to have in their briefcase. I think we're coming down to about the last uh, five minutes or so. Uh, do you mind if we move to the next slide? Uh, common law voluntariness. Uh, the rule is essentially boiled down to these two rules. 
a statement of the defendant will be suppressed as involuntary. Number one, if the police make an implied or explicit promise of some benefit in the form of, quote, special consideration from a prosecuting authority or some other form of assistance, or conversely, some explicit or implicit threat regarding similar subjects. And then number two, the defendant's statement is made in reliance on that promise or threat. Now, it's the prosecution's burden by proponents of the evidence at the confession suppression hearing to prove that these two um, elements are not met. And therefore, the, the common law uh, involuntary or the common law voluntariness test is not applicable. So just keep in mind that uh, this is a very pro-defendant standard. If you look, we, we did a study of all 50 states in the nation, and there's about eight states in the nation that have a common law voluntariness rule as favorable or almost as favorable as Maryland. It's the oftentimes when I talk to other lawyers, I call it the too good to be true rule. And it really is. A, defend, a statement in Maryland in order to be ruled involuntary on the common law voluntariness rule to be the nicest, most respectful interrogation ever seen. But if there is a statement that is an implicit promise of some benefit of success, special consideration from a prosecuting authority or some other form of assistance, and it, that it, you can show that there is some reliance, then the, uh, or the state can't prove that there was no reliance, then the subsequent statement is involuntary. And this applies to non-custodial interrogations as well. You move to the next slide, please. All right, the first prong, the defendant's subjective belief that he would receive a benefit in exchange for confessing carries no weight. Uh, it is an objective inquiry. Uh, in the first prong, the definition of an improper promise is informed by, quote, whether a reasonable lay person in the position of the petitioner would have inferred from the detective statement that he could gain the advantage of non-prosecution or some other form of assistance. And also in the first prong, an improper inducement made by an officer can relate to the benefit, to a benefit to the defendant provided by a non-state actor. Uh, and in, in the more lengthy uh, handout that we, the 29 page handout that we gave you, uh, you can find all the sites to these cases uh, and many more. And in the book, I think the first like 300 pages of the book is devoted to uh, both common law and due process voluntariness. And the next uh, slide, please. Second prong, for the second prong, the analysis of whether the suspect makes a confession is apparent in, in apparent reliance on the police officer's explicit or implicit inducement is limited to very few factors. The time elapsed between the inducement and the confession and whether any other intervening factors could have caused the confession. The defendant does not have the burden to prove reliance. The state bears the burden to prove by proponents of the evidence that the accused did not make the inculpatory statement in reliance on the improper inducement. The CSA has said that one factor is whether the defendant takes the stand at the motions hearing. The Court of Appeals has never ruled on this. Judge Moylan in, in three other cases besides Jackson uh, has said that it was a factor in the voluntariness analysis in favor of the state that the defendant did not take the stand. Court of Appeals has never ruled on that, and I think it'll be very interesting when they finally do. Move on to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, now, I'm gonna end, as we did in the beginning, with a very pro-state case, um, Williams versus State. This is that case out of Prince George's County, the College Park case. Um, just read this and you'll see how the Court of Appeals is sort of inching, appears to be inching. Uh, there's too much to say as to why. There are other cases as to why I think the Court of Appeals is inching away from the too good to be true rule uh, and is watering down the common law rule of voluntariness. Uh, the detective says here to this young man, you may never see outside again if you let us leave here thinking that. Moving on to the next. But I need to hear from you and figure out how sincere you are that that's not what you meant to happen. Then moving down, we ain't taking no deals. We're walking out the door. We ain't even talking to you. Send you straight to jail. I mean, if that's the way I mean, but we are not like that. We want to give people opportunity. The Court of Appeals ruled seven to nothing that that was not an improper set of, or was not a set of improper promises at all to cause the operation of the 
um, common law voluntariness rule to cause the subsequent statement to be ruled involuntary. So uh, thank you for your patience. Thank you for being here um, on this uh, uh, confession lecture. If you have any questions, I've put my uh, phone number on the front page. It's uh, of the uh, PowerPoint 301-742-7470. I love to get questions because um, it helps me. We have to update the book every year. Uh, and if the questions that you give me throughout the year on these undecided areas of confession law help us update the book. Thank you very much. And uh, my colleague, Jimenez Chicas, the immigration guru, will be next. Um, I'm hoping that Christine can get on because my dog just started barking at somebody delivering a package, <laughs> which is a little distracting. So, let me, well, maybe he'll. Okay, yeah, I am. Um, so let me introduce to you Jimenez Chicas. He is the lead attorney and the head of the immigration department at the law offices of Jezik and Moyes. He is the past chair of the immigration law section of the Maryland State Bar Association and the vice chair of the AILA DC chapter. Um, he's the liaison to DHS and ICE in, and the ICE Baltimore field office. Jimenez focuses his, in, his practice on immigration and the intersection of immigration and criminal law, namely the immigration consequences of criminal convictions on non-citizens. He advises clients and their criminal defense attorneys on these matters, including crafting immigration friendly plea deals providing pretrial immigration advisory opinions, and serving as an expert witness in post-conviction matters before the criminal courts. Jimenez also directly represents clients facing removal proceedings before the EOIR, requesting release on bond, challenging removal, and or applying for various forms of relief from removal before the immigration courts. He also represents clients in administrative appeals before the BIA, as well as petitions for review before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. He has been counsel of record on a number of published opinions from the BIA and the Fourth Circuit. Jimenez lectured and presented in numerous conferences, symposia, and training sessions to practitioners on immigration law, including, including private criminal defense attorneys, public defenders, state prosecutors, and state court judges. He has been named a rising star in Maryland by super lawyers and has been named one of the top immigration attorneys in the area by Washington and Bethesda Magazine. He is also a current board member of the Capital Area Immigrants' Rights Coalition. Jimenez is a member of the Maryland State Bar and is admitted to practice in the U.S. District Court for Maryland and the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Um, Jimenez, thank you so much for being here uh, and sharing your expertise with us. Great. Thank you so Great. much thank for that so much. introduction, Christine. And uh, thank you for, uh, to the MSBA for allowing me to present uh, alongside Bob and Andy, uh, two of the most prominent, knowledgeable, and effective uh, Maryland attorneys here in the state. Um, I'm going to talk to you all about, and hopefully I still have your attention, uh, criminal um, law as it relates to immigration. Uh, many of you have uh, clients who are not U.S. citizens, and so my presentation is going to be focused on the ways, uh, really the fundamentals and what you all have to look out for. Um, the important caveat is that, and, and I tell this to my colleagues here at the firm all the time, there is no one size fits all advice. You know, the advice in terms of the immigration consequences is going to take into account a number of different factors. It's going to take into account your client's immigration history, your client's criminal history. It's going to take into account um, your client's goals. Um, if we could go to the first slide. So uh, we have a pretty nice PowerPoint here for you guys to, and there's a lot of good case law that you guys can refer to. What I'm going to do is um, present kind of a, an overview of the main areas um, uh, in terms of inadmissibility, deportability, what we now collectively call removability issues. And then we're going to look at some specific Maryland statutes and some of the case law that's come out of the Court of Appeals in terms of what is the immigration consequence. My 
PowerPoint presentation is done, so we will make that available to you all. Um, we should have gone, uh, had Bob go last because he had a very nice presentation with graphics and movie clips. Unfortunately, mine doesn't have that, um, but hopefully I can keep your attention. Um, so why, why, what is your duty as criminal defense attorneys and, and why is this important? Um, I know we do have some prosecutors also listening, so I think it's very important for y'all to know this. You guys certainly do have a lot of power uh, to work with criminal defense attorneys in resolving cases. Um, it, so, but, but basically the Supreme Court has said that, and, and this was a, a seminal case uh, that, that finally came out in 2010, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, it's the Padilla v. Kentucky case. Um, and that case looked at the ineffective assistance uh, case law, you know, the seminal case of Strickland v. Washington, and basically said that it is the criminal defense attorney's obligation to advise um, their non-citizen clients what the immigration consequences of a criminal conviction are. Um, the criminal consequences are vast. And, um, you know, I think in the Padilla case, the Supreme Court Judge Stevens in his um, majority decision uh, considered and, and recognized that sometimes a criminal client is going to be willing to go to jail for a longer time if that means preserving their ability to remain in the country, if that means they're going to be able to uh, have relief in court. Um, and so that's the seminal case that we're talking about. And this is kind of the overview is the Padilla case. Now, here in the state of Maryland, there's been some good case law that's come out, which also recognizes the importance of this. I think the, the latest case from the Court of Appeals is the San Martin, Martin Prado case, which uh, I've cited there um, on the PowerPoint slide. We'll go to the next one. Um, next slide, please. So, so the question becomes, you know, when do you want to look at immigration issues? And, and the answer is to any non-U.S. citizen. Um, Section 101 uh, of the INA defines alien, and that's the technical term that's used in the immigration laws and in the statutes. Um, an alien is any person who's not a U.S. citizen. Now, a person can, can be uh, uh, a U.S. citizen. They can have naturalized. They could have been born in this country. They could have acquired citizenship, derived citizenship. Um, and then there's also even some situations where um, a, an individual is born in the U.S., but they're not citizens. Those are those are very rare, but it's important to be on the lookout for that. For example, if you ever have a, a person who is a son or daughter of a diplomat, even though they were born physically in the United States, they may not be a citizen of the United States. And that's going to require special attention and consideration. But everyone else, for the most part, is going to, in fact, need um, and anyone who's, who's born in the U.S., you don't need to worry about their immigration issues with the caveat of your diplomat, um, children of diplomats. Everyone else is going to need that, that advice, whether they're a green card holder, whether they are here on non-immigrant visas, whether they, they're here on some kind of an asylum status. Uh, temporary protective status is a big status here for a lot of our residents in the state of Maryland. Individuals that have what's called deferred action for childhood arrivals, DACA or individuals that do not have any status whatsoever. So all of this is gonna be taking, uh, you know, the advice you're gonna be giving to your non-citizen clients is for anyone who's not a citizen, okay? So it's, it, it's gonna be a, a large chunk of your clientele, I imagine. We go to the next slide. Um, and then the question then is, okay, what is a conviction, right? Um, if you know you have a, a non-citizen client, then the next question is, how do we get a disposition that's favorable? Okay, um, and and the INA has a very specific definition for what a conviction is under immigration laws, and that's found in 101A48A of the Immigration Act. Um, now, in Maryland, um, and I'm I'm still surprised that I you know I, I speak to a lot of criminal defense attorneys who who are still not aware of the fact that, you know, a PBJ, a probation before judgment, which is a special kind of disposition here in Maryland. In fact, even though it's not a conviction under state law, it is a conviction under federal immigration law. And, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of criminal defense attorneys, uh, you know, unknowingly tell their clients, you'll be fine. This is not a conviction uh, because it's not under state law. But then, you know, the the non-citizen client finds out, in fact, no, this is going to be a problem. Um, and so I'm highlighting two dispositions here um, in Maryland. Uh, the PBJ um, is, in fact, a conviction. And there's a Fourth Circuit case back from 1993 and a board case that recognizes that. 
Um, and then the stat disposition, which is a different kind of a disposition, uh, that is not a conviction for immigration purposes. And the reason why is because of the definition of conviction under the INA. Conviction requires basically a judgment of uh, uh, a judgment or entry, a finding of guilt, and then a punishment. Um, and so there's actually uh, there, there's been some legislation that's been pushed um, in the last couple years to change the PBJ statute. It gotten some pushback from some of the um, prosecutors' uh, offices and, and, and even some defense attorneys. Um, I think from my standpoint, I've been working with a coalition of immigration attorneys that are trying to get this legislation through, and I think it's worth checking out. I, I cited it here on my PowerPoint slide. It's Senate Bill 653, it, but it's meant to cure the PBJ statute in Maryland so that, it, that in certain circumstances, it cannot and won't be considered a conviction. That's pending legislation. Um, and I note that there just so that you guys can be aware of the fact that there is legislation out there percolating. But nevertheless, you should know that the way the PBJ statute is now in Maryland, it is a conviction. And and so um, your clients, uh, if you know, I see this very often where they get a PBJ for a drug offense. And while it might be a great disposition um, in terms of uh, the state case, sometimes the result is automatic deportation when we get to immigration court. Um, so that's that's something very important to be cognizant of. We go to the next slide, please. So um, when we talk about issues that trigger removal for our non-citizen clients, um, the 1996 change in the laws era, IRA, uh, was the last time there was a wholesale um, change to the immigration laws. And, and what, what that basically did is it it encapsulated what we now know as grounds of removability. Grounds of removability include both grounds of admissibility um, uh, and deportability. Um, and so basically inadmissibility uh, deals with individuals that are trying to get entry into the country, trying to be admitted into the U.S. So the easiest way of thinking about that are individuals that are coming into the U.S., presenting themselves at a port of entry, whether it be at an airport, whether it be at a, uh, at a port of entry in Canada and Mexico, where have you, uh, those are individuals that are trying to come into the country. But we also have um, sometimes our green card holders who are considered um, applicants for admission. And we're going to talk about that in more detail in a little bit. Um, so just think about inadmissibility as individuals trying to come into the country um, and seeking to enter the country, to be admitted into the country. Now, we also have a, a curious case of individuals that are already in the country. They might be here, for example, on a non-immigrant visa, and then they are applying for a green card, even though they're physically already in the United States. When they're applying for that green card, what they are doing is they are having to overcome grounds of inadmissibility to show that they are admissible into the United States. Um, deportability, on the other hand, deals with individuals that are physically present in the United States. So those are individuals that have been inspected, admitted, and for whatever reason, they committed a crime that renders them deportable. So these are two concepts that we're going to talk about them um, more directly, to try to make um, make make sense of these two important concepts, because it, they're, they're things you always have to think about. And and hopefully um, some of the examples we talk about will highlight the importance and the differences of considering both grounds of inadmissibility and deportability. Now, uh, one additional note I would say is that individuals that are here without any status, so our clients that enter without inspection, they usually are gonna be subject to grounds of inadmissibility. Again, they, even though they might be physically present in the United States, they were never actually admitted into the country. And so they're gonna be subject to, to the grounds of uh, inadmissibility. Um, and um, we're, that, that the TPS statute that, that, were, that I referenced in, in the last poll that we'll talk about in a moment. So if we go to the next slide, please. Okay, so very important just to highlight, um, when it comes to um, admissibility and deportability, there are burdens of proof within the immigration system. Um, when it comes to grounds of deportability, the government must show by clear and convincing evidence that a non-citizen who has been admitted is in fact um, deportable. Um, and that's under INA section 240C3. Um, so when we go to immigration court and the government wants to deport someone, it's their burden of proof to show number one, the conviction exists, and we're going to talk about what the record of conviction and, and, and the kinds of evidence that the Department of Homeland Security normally files in these cases in a bit. Um, it's their burden of proof to show that, in fact, 
the conviction renders someone deportable. Um, in terms of inadmissibility, it's usually our burden to show that someone, uh, uh, our burden being, you know, the, the non-citizen, uh, that someone is admissible by clear and convincing evidence. Um, now, either way, whether someone is is deportable and admissible, when someone's applying for a benefit, it's always our burden uh, as a non-citizen to show that we are eligible for the relief being sought. Um, so that's an important distinction in terms of burdens of proof. And and a lot of the case law that we're going to talk about is going to uh, hopefully be highlighted in terms of these these shifting burdens that exist. So we go to the next slide, please. All right, so we're going to talk about first, uh, what are the common grounds of deportability? Again, keeping in mind deportable individuals are those that have been admitted. These are individuals that may be entered as a green card holder, right? Um, and I've had many clients that are being put in deportation proceedings, um, even though they've been green card holders for over 10, 20, 30 years. Or these are individuals that uh, were admitted under a non-immigrant visa and either are still within valid status of that visa or violated the terms of that visa or overstayed that visa, what have you. Those are, these are, we're going to focus on the, the common criminal grounds of deportability. Um, I think the most, uh, the, and these are the most typical ones that we see, um, crime involving moral turpitude. There is a plethora of case law on uh, what is a CIMT conviction. Um, now, the immigration laws when it comes to deportability basically says that an individual is deportable if they have committed um, a CIMT offense within five years after the date of admission. Um, so it, 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 the, the immigration history here is important because you might have an individual that entered, let's say, on a student visa uh, in 2000 and then became a permanent resident in 2006, right? Uh, and then they were convicted of a CIMT offense in 2007. Is that person gonna be deportable? No, and the reason why is because the 2000 date of admission is the one that controls. The within five applies to any, um, any ground of, um, or any criminal conviction within the five years of the initial admission, whether that be on a non-immigrant visa or whether that be on, a, on an immigrant visa. Um, but then there's, a, there's also a different ground of deportability that says anyone who's been convicted of two or more CIMT offenses at any point is deportable. And so that means if you have a client that was convicted of a CIMT offense 20 years ago and then they get convicted of a second one uh, now, those two combined can, in fact, render your client deportable. This is a perfect example of, of why I tell you that there's no one size fits all advice for clients, because we need to know the client's criminal history, their immigration history. Um, and so we might have a client that can plead to a CIMT offense, uh, even though they maybe are out of status or even though they they got their green card many years after having been originally admitted on a non-immigrant visa. Um, all of these are important fact intensive inquiries that we as the immigration attorney needs to know before we can uh, give some advice to our to our criminal defense attorneys and to our non-citizen clients. Um, so so we're going to talk about more of what a CIMT offense is. There's been a, a lot of case law in terms of what it is, and you'd be surprised. Um, Sometimes I'm left scratching my head uh, in terms of the analysis. I think the here in Maryland, we've had some very interesting case law we're going to talk about uh, shortly in terms of what is a CIMT and what is not. Um, but the other uh, common ground of deportability that we see is the CDS ground, um, controlled dangerous substance. Basically, that says anyone who's been convicted um, of any CDS offense, whether it's a state offense, whether it's a uh, federal offense is deportable. The the exception being, and this is for deportability, the exception being a single offense uh, involving possession uh, for one's own use of 30 grams of marijuana or less. Okay, that's the single exception, even for green card holders. Okay, um, so if your client has a possession uh, of a blunt, which is less than a gram of marijuana, and they get a second one, they become deportable. Um, and then 
you know, depending on when that conviction or when that offense was committed is going to impact whether they have any relief. Um, immigration law is very arcane, notwithstanding what we're seeing from many states in terms of the legalization of, of CDS marijuana. Um, immigration law is very unforgiving when it comes to um, CDS offenses. And as, as we're going to see, even though a green card holder, for example, is not going to be deportable for having a single um, for having a conviction for for a uh, for a possession of a 30 grams of marijuana or less. That doesn't mean they're not going to be out of the woods in terms of any immigration consequences. In fact, we're going to see when we talk about the inadmissibility ground the, that, that relates to this this deportability ground, there will be uh, a consequence. That person is going to be inadmissible for that same possession of less than 30 grams of marijuana that didn't render them deportable, it's still going to render them inadmissible. If we could go to the next slide, please. So some additional uh, grounds of deportability, firearms offenses. Um, this is a possession of, of, of a firearm. Um, it's a very broad statute. Um, I think that um, all the Maryland uh, firearms offenses here in this in, in, within the state would trigger this ground of deportability. So what, what we've done in many cases um, uh, is there's a great statute when possible, we try to plead our clients out to possession of, uh, of a dangerous weapon. And the way that the statute, Maryland statute defines dangerous weapon explicitly excludes firearms. Um, we've had some success in terms of negotiating with prosecutors um, to try to get a conviction um, uh, that was either in the, in the context of a post-conviction or even during a plea, uh, pre-conviction, we try to get um, meet with the prosecutors and explain this is a fatal, uh, a fatal ground of deportability for our client who's a non-citizen. Can you please meet us halfway? Let's plead down to possession of a dangerous weapon instead of possession of a firearm. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but uh, I think uh, safe to say that in, ter in terms of all the Maryland offenses, pos any, any possession of a firearm is going to be a deportable offense for our non-citizen clients. The other one that we're seeing a lot more uh, lately is the crimes of domestic violence, violations of protective order, crimes against children. That's found at 237A2E of the Immigration Act. Um, DHS has been charging this ground a lot more, and it has to do with uh, some of the Fourth Circuit case law that, that, that regarding the categorical approach that we've seen. Um, this ground is a lot broader in terms of, um, especially when it comes to crimes against children. Um, we've had some success in terms of the aggravated felony ground of sexual abuse of a minor. Um, DHS um, has been charging uh, this ground um, in addition to sexual abuse of a minor. We usually prevail on the AGFEL ground, and we're going to talk about aggravated felonies very shortly and, and why those are so important to try to avoid for our non-citizen clients. Um, the impact is, is very detrimental, um, but we're going to talk about that in a moment. But th th keep in mind, um, 237A2E, very broad ground. Um, here in Maryland, as, as in, insofar as the domestic violence ground goes, I know that most domestic violence offenses are charged as assaults, um, so there's no explicit domestic violence, um, criminal uh, violation. Now, that said, um, the second degree assault statute in Maryland, which we're going to talk about in a little more detail, is no longer considered a crime of violence, and there, therefore it doesn't trigger the domestic violence ground. Um, but nevertheless, um, I think when it comes to discretionary applications, even a second degree assault uh, conviction is going to be problematic. But in terms of triggering this specific ground of deportability, um, we don't see the DV ground here in Maryland so much because there's no explicit DV ground unless someone's convicted, for example, of first degree assault and it was in a domestic violence context, that would be a little different. Um, violations of protective orders, we do have those grounds. And in fact, we were successfully, uh, we're, we'll talk about this ground specifically, we were having some success uh, with some of the immigration judges here in Baltimore uh, until we got a, a board case not uh, not too long ago that that kind of quashed that argument we had been advancing. Um, so these are uh, probably more common now than they were when I started practicing, but the important ones to keep a, keep an eye out for nonetheless. We go to the next slide. 
Um, so the aggravated felony ground, that's probably the big one that we want to avoid. Um, and an aggravated felony is a term of art the same way a CIMT, a crime involving moral turpitude, is a term of art under immigration laws. Um, and aggravated felonies run the gamut. And they're defined in 101A43A through U of the INA. Um, and I've listed some of the more common ones that we see. Um, 101A43A, for example, says murder, rape, or sexual abuse of a minor is an aggravated felony, irrespective of the sentence, irrespective of anything. 101A43B, illicit trafficking in a CDS, again, irrespective of the sentence, is going to be an aggravated felony. 101A43F, a crime of violence, uh, that's going to be triggered by a sentence of one year or more. 101A43G, any theft or burglary offense, um, also going to be triggered by a sentence of one year or more. Um, and it, it's important to note that for immigration purposes, the sentence, whether it's served or suspended, doesn't matter. So if your client receives a sentence of um, six months, um, or rather, let's say three years to spend all but six months, the sentence for immigration purposes is three years. And that will trigger, and, and sometimes um, there's a misconception that, you know, what controls is how much time did my client actually serve? No, it's how much time was imposed, whether it's suspended, whether it's served, executed, what have you. Um, important that you guys know that any time that's actually um, ordered by the court is going to be what's dispositive in terms of whether it triggers the ag fell ground. Um, now, uh, the fraud or deceit ground is another one that's big. Um, this one, though, is triggered by something different. This one is triggered by uh, the loss amount. And the INA under 101A43L says that if you have been convicted of a fraud offense and you receive a sentence, um, I'm sorry, and, and, the, and the, the loss to the victim is 10000 or more, then it will trigger this aggravated felony ground of removal. The sentence doesn't matter. Um, and we're not going to get into to this specific, uh, it's called the circumstance specific approach so much. Suffice it to say that if your client is convicted of a, a fraud offense to the extent it's within your ability, what you want to focus on is limiting the record of conviction and even uh, documents outside the record of conviction uh, to show that the loss of the victim was 10000 or less. Um, and there actually are ways of getting around this. Um, and we're going to talk about the Maryland theft statute. We've actually represented some clients um, who pled to such uh, statutes like the Maryland embezzlement statute, uh, where the loss was well beyond $10,000. Um, the embezzlement statute, I think, in the eyes of some criminal defense attorneys, is better than felony theft. And I think they would be right except that if your client is a non-citizen, it's going to create huge problems. And so what we've been able to do sometimes is actually find a way to have our clients um, go back to court by way of a post-conviction petition and replay to uh, felony theft, believe it or not. And we'll talk about why felony theft, um, where there's a loss of 10000 or more, is a better disposition than embezzlement. Um, and, and we'll talk about that case law in a few slides uh, in in, in the near future. So we go to the next one. Um, and then uh, also important to note that under 101A43U, any any attempt or conspiracy uh, to 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 uh, commit any of the enumerated aggravated felonies is going to be considered an aggravated felony as well. Um, so then uh, those that's kind of a very broad overview of the grounds of deportability. Now let's look at the crime, the grounds of inadmissibility. Um, these are the more common ones that we see as well. There's a lot more uh, that we see. And I see we have a question. And, and by the way, I'm happy to take your questions as we go along. Um, so feel free to send them. Um, uh, Erica, you can read that whenever you want. Um, but I, Of course, the dog barks whenever I have to read something. Um, <laughs> somebody just asked, what about if the assault second degree is marked as DV related? It doesn't matter. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it will not trigger the DV ground of deportability. And that's when I say it doesn't matter. Um, now, that said, that will matter for purposes of maybe getting your client out on bond 
uh, in the immigration court, it will matter for purposes of discretionary relief. Um, but because the DV ground explicitly requires that it be a crime of violence, even if your second degree assault conviction has that little box check that says it's a DV related crime, it's not going to trigger the 237 H3 ground of deportability. It's a good question on that. Um, all right, so let's talk about crimes of um, or grounds of inadmissibility. Um, the CIMT concept again comes into play here. Um, Whereas, if you recall, when we talked about um, grounds of deportability, that was triggered by uh, commission of a CIMT offense within five years of admission. Uh, if someone leaves the country and then comes back, and this includes, again, our permanent resident clients, they could trigger a ground of inadmissibility. Um, and this is, um, this is always a problem because, you know, sometimes you have to advise your clients um, and, and when we talk about the CDS ground, which we'll talk about in a minute, you have to advise your clients, even though maybe you take this deal, you're not deportable. We always tell our clients, you also should not leave the country because if you leave the country, you're going to be inadmissible. And at the end of the day, it's going to mean the same thing. You're going to be pointed in removal proceedings. Um, and so um, for purposes of the CIMT ground of inadmissibility, basically it says that um, you know, it's it's any offense uh, that is deemed a CIMT. And again, we're going to talk about what is a CIMT in a moment. Um, but there is um, and, and importantly, for for grounds of inadmissibility, whereas grounds of deportability require a conviction. All right. And we talked about the definition of conviction under the INA. Um, for purposes of inadmissibility, there there need not be a conviction there. All that all that's required under the INA is admission uh, to the commission of the essential elements of the offense. And there are specific protocols that, you know, these officers either at the consulate or at, or at the airport, the CBP officers have to do for it to be, for it to trigger a, an admission of the commission of the essential elements. Uh, but nonetheless, it's important that you guys are, are well aware and, and, and advising your clients, you know, you may want, you may not want to speak so much when you are interviewed at the consulate or when you are, um, being interviewed by a CBP officer in secondary inspection. Um, now, there is something called a petty offense exception that applies in a lot of these cases and uh, for CIMT offenses. And basically, the petty offense exception says that if the, the, the statute of conviction carries a maximum sentence of one year, but your client receives six months or less, then they will not trigger that inadmissibility ground, notwithstanding the fact that your client's uh, uh, offense is a CIMT offense. Um, we also look at, um, uh, again, we talked about the CDS grounds, um, basically any drug ground is going to render you any CDS conviction is going to render your client inadmissible. Um, in fact, it's even worse when it comes to drug trafficking, there is a ground of inadmissibility that says that if the consular officer or the CBP officer has a reason to believe that your client's a drug trafficker and that reason to believe standard is very loosey-goosey um there the case law that exists is not very favorable um suffice it to say that it's going to probably trigger issues if your client has a conviction for any cds uh related offense that be, that involves selling trafficking drugs um even if your client for example is not deportable under the aggravated felony ground uh, the analysis in that in that scenario is very different. So it's important to, to, to advise your clients who have these criminal issues. Again, you probably are better off not leaving the country because if you leave the country, you're going to trigger problems once you try to return. And as I mentioned before, your client who is a permanent resident who may be pled guilty to possessing, you know, a blunt, a uh, marijuana blunt, um, while that person is not deportable, if they decide to take a vacation you know, out to Mexico or Canada, or if they decide to go visit a family member outside the country in their home country, they will be inadmissible once they return, even though they were not deportable. Um, and so that those individuals need to be aware that they should not leave the country. Now, we're going to talk about um, citizenship issues uh, towards the end. But I think it's important to note that, you know, even though this someone might be inadmissible doesn't mean that they are not going to be uh, eligible for naturalization. Um, 
that's part of the analysis that we take into account when we advise our non-citizen clients about the uh, consequences. So yes, you do want to take into account what are your client's goals? Again, staying in the country, remaining eligible for relief, being eligible for citizenship at some point in the near future. Um, so takeaway in terms of CDS is that there always will be a consequence uh, regardless of anything. Now, uh, I think it's, even though I haven't had a case personally, it's safe to say that the the new Maryland statute uh, that that imposes only a civil fine for possessing, I think it's less than 10 grams of marijuana. I would argue those are not criminal issues, but they do come into play again, because keep in mind, as I said, for inadmissibility, you don't need a conviction, right? It's, it's basically um, admission to the commission of the essential elements of the offense. And, and so I, I would, I would, even though I would say it's not a conviction, it wouldn't trigger deportability. I would still be very hesitant to say to a client, even if you get one of these civil infractions, you have no immigration issues. So I think you will. I think it's safe to assume you will. And you have to take that conservative approach, I think, in terms of the advice, especially given the um, heavy handed enforcement from the current administration. Um, some of the other common grounds of inadmissibility we see uh, multiple criminal convictions where you have an aggregate sentence of five years or more. And this is irrespective of where the offenses are CIMTs. I think the perfect example here is, uh, you know, DUIs. If we have any clients that have multiple DUI offenses, DUIs for our green card holders do not trigger deportability or inadmissibility generally. Uh, they will impact naturalization. But let's say you have a client who has multiple DUIs. Uh, let's say they are green card holder. Let's say they've gotten a suspended sentence of more than five years on a totality of different charges that person will be inadmissible. And the reason why is because of this multiple criminal grounds uh, inadmissibility uh, uh, charge that DHS could lodge. Again, you're looking at what was the sentence irrespective of whether the time was served or suspended. Um, I talked about reason to believe someone's a, a controlled substance trafficker. Um, keep an eye out for that for any client who has any kind of a trafficking uh, conviction. Um, and then some of the other ones we don't see as often, but there is a ground for uh, engaging in prostitution, commercialized vice. Um, if you have a diplomatic client who asserts immunity, that will render that person inadmissible as well. We go to the next slide, please. Um, and, and just very quickly, uh, I mentioned this before, even our returning uh, returning permanent residents can be deemed inadmissible under 101A13C of the Immigration Act. Um, basically, if someone leaves the country, even though they're a green card holder and they have an offense that will trigger them inadmissible, once they return, they would be deemed a returning permanent resident. Um, and therefore, they would be deemed inadmissible um, by way of having a, a, a 212A2 offense. Um, there was a case uh, from the Board of Immigration Appeals. The Board of Immigration Appeals is the administrative appellate level. Uh, they're the ones that kind of set the law across the country uh, for all the immigration judges. Um, they basically said that um, that it, it is the government's burden. So again, in terms of whose burden of proof is it, when you have a returning LPR, it's a government's burden to show that in fact, um, your, your returning LPRs fall within this category of inadmissible um, aliens. Um, so keep an eye out on that. Uh, again, just to stress that even your returning green card holder clients can be uh, inadmissible if they leave the country and they have a, an offense that's going to trigger inadmissibility. We go to the next one, please. Um, very important to discuss this because um, we I've had many clients who are in immigration proceedings and who are in ICE custody. And then they're left scratching their heads saying, why am I sitting in ICE jail when I didn't serve a single day uh, in on the state case? And it's because of 236C. It's uh, the immigration law allows ICE, uh, DHS, to take anyone who's in removal proceedings into custody um, under 236A. Now, 236C goes a step further and says, that certain individuals 
must remain in custody. Now, keep in mind, DHS always has unfettered discretion to release someone. Um, but they usually seldom exercise that discretion if someone is subject to mandatory detention. Um, and so basically, you have many individuals that may want to bond out, but because of the nature of the conviction, they can't. So for example, anyone who's been convicted of an aggravated felony cannot be given a bond by an immigration judge. And, and you can go to the immigration judge, you can fight. The immigration judge might be sympathetic to your client, but the immigration judge's hands are tied. And the immigration judge will say, I'm sorry, I just do not have discretion to release your client. And so what does that mean? Your client remains detained in ICE custody for months fighting their case. Um, and, and, and this is, again, one of the consequences of, of criminal convictions. Um, you know, the firearms offense is one of the grounds that renders someone subject to mandatory detention. A CDS ground will mention will render someone subject to mandatory detention. Multiple CIMTs will render someone subject to mandatory detention. 236C, um, my, the language is there. You guys can read it. Um, important to say that, you know, the, the, the validity of 236C has been challenged many times. Um, Demore v. Kim was a, was a seminal case back in 03. The challenge 236C in the Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court found that it was constitutionally valid. Most recently, there was a case um, uh, from the Supreme Court in Jennings v. Rodriguez, uh, which talked about do individuals have a, a right to basically review their, their custody status on a periodic basis. Um, the, the Moore v. Kim and, and some of the cases that followed took into account a uh, government um, assertion that deportation proceedings were no more than about, I think, six to eight months. And so the Supreme Court said that, you know, an individual that's detained for six months is, and that was part of the reasoning why they found it to be valid, uh, the mandatory detention provision, that six months wasn't that bad. Uh, well, it turns out that these proceedings take a lot longer, especially if, an, if a non-citizen is exercising his or her rights to challenge their removal all the way up to the Court of Appeals level, sometimes resulting in remands, multiple remands, you know, they remain detained during that whole time. Um, you know, I've had a client uh, recently um, who has who was detained in ICE custody for almost five years. Um, and fortunately, we got him out before this whole COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in fact, it was a week or two before all this came to light uh, by way of a habeas petition. And, and that was the only way we could do it. So while Jennings uh, was a bad case insofar as it found that there's no bright line rule for uh, periodic review, uh, it does allow an as-applied challenge to prolonged detention. Um, and that's something we're seeing a lot um, in terms of uh, litigation, trying to get our clients out. Obviously, a non-citizen client is gonna be more inclined to fight their case uh, when they're free as opposed to when they're detained. And I think that the government is wise to that. And, and, and strategically, they wanna keep individuals detained because they know that many non-citizens are going to just throw in the towel and give up. Um, that said, um, you know, from the get-go, before your client pleads guilty, they must know that if they plead guilty to a certain offense, um, even though they might have, for example, relief on the table, they will be detained. And that's one of the biggest things that I see is when we, when we have a client who we weren't able to advise before uh, he or she pled guilty for uh, whatever reason, they are saying, well, get me out of custody. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't. You know, the law says we cannot. Um, and that's that's a very tough concept to grasp with. Um, and I think that that, you know, under the Padilla case, I think it's an important factor that criminal defense attorneys must advise their clients about if they're going to be detained mandatorily, especially if it's going to mean a detention of, of, of months, sometimes even years. And we'll go to the next. Okay, so there's a uh, so in terms of the, the the overview of deportability versus inadmissibility, there are some loopholes. They they kind of track one another in many ways, but they also don't. So, for example, certain deportable crimes, um, there are certain crimes of deportability that are not crimes of inadmissibility. These include, for example, aggravated felonies. These include domestic violence, stalking, child abuse, violation of protective orders, firearms offenses. So, even though, for example, your client um, is deportable for an ACFEL, he or she is not going to be inadmissible. Now, if they are deported because of the ACFEL and then try to re-enter, that's a different ground of inadmissibility. But uh, 
that AGFL will likely render your client inadmissible because it's either going to be a CIMT offense, a CDS offense, uh, or some other inadmissible crime. Um, there are also some grounds that are uh, grounds of inadmissibility that do not have a ground of deportability. These include the reason to believe that someone is engaging in drug trafficking, that very broad ground that I mentioned to you before. And importantly here, keep in mind what I told you, whose burden of proof is it? It's going to be the DHS's burden of proof, right, to show that your client's deportable. They would have a hard, hard time getting around this reason to believe that someone's engaged in drug trafficking. Um, and then the CIMT, the admission, uh, the 212 ground, like I said, doesn't require a conviction. All that requires is a an admission. Um, the one, the one loophole that I always find interesting is the, the firearms offense. So while a non-citizen can be removable for that firearms offense, they are not inadmissible for it. Now that's that if your client is applying for relief or applying for adjustment of status, uh, they have a, they have a duty to disclose any and all criminal offenses. And I think that would certainly be taken into account by an immigration judge or by the adjudicating officer in terms of discretion. Um, discretion, discretion, discretion is a big concept in immigration law. Um, and I think that, that we cannot, uh, I always advise this to my colleagues here in the office, even though I say, fine, you can plead them out to second degree assault, but discretion, right? Discretion, uh, is going to be a huge issue if your client's going to be applying for cancellation or removal or some other benefit. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Okay, so let's try to just over let the the broad concepts we've 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 discussed so far. Um, you know, when you're when you're dealing with a non-citizen client, you know, number one is your, is your client a non-citizen? Okay, that's question number one, key question. Number two, is there a conviction? Okay, um, again, keep in mind Maryland's PBJ statute is a conviction. Uh, Maryland's stat uh, disposition is not a conviction. And then uh, nali prosequi, obviously, is not a conviction. And then uh, a guilty plea is a conviction. Um, a guilty finding by a jury or by a judge is a conviction, obviously. Um, now, we're going to scratch the surface on, and we're going to probably do this more in, in by way of the, uh, the actual case laws that we're going to look at um, from the uh, specific Maryland statutes. Um, you know, the... The, the categorical approach is what controls here. And there's been a lot of good case law uh, from 2011 on, uh, 2010 on, I would say. Um, and the Fourth Circuit has, has been kind of one of the leading circuits in the country uh, that's been applying the categorical approach, the modified categorical approach uh, correctly, in my view. Um, so, you know, the, the, the one question, obviously, federal immigration law is federal in nature, but, you know, we're talking about state offenses here offenses that are going to render your client deportable. So uh, the basic question under the categorical analysis is what does the state statute say as compared to the federal statute, right? So for example, um, when we look at, you know, sexual abuse of a minor, right? That's one of the aggravated felony grounds under 101A43A. What does the state say? Uh, what is the federal statute? How does it define it? That one's maybe a bad example. And I will talk about that case in a moment. Um, but how does the federal law define the underlying offense, the generic offense, and then how does the state law define it? So what we're looking at as immigration attorneys is, is, is the statute overbroad with compared to the generic ground of removal. Um, and then the second question we're looking at is, is the statute divisible, right? Does it contain different uh, crimes? Um, and I think the Maryland theft statute is a great example of where you would think it's a divisible statute, but it actually turns out it's not. Um, the cases that we saw that came out that kind of crystallized and began to put a lot of this into focus were two Supreme Court cases um, from 2013, the Moncrief case and the Decomps case. Um, these are two seminal cases that really uh, put into, into the correct uh, focus the way the categorical and modified categorical analysis should be applied. Um, and when I talk about second degree assault statute here in Maryland, I think that will Hopefully it'll it'll crystallize it for everyone um, in terms of what makes the statute overbroad, what makes the statute divisible. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, so before we start talking about specific Maryland statutes, um, as I said, the DHS has the burden of proof to show that 
an individual number one is is deportable and and that they have to show that a person has been deported of the offense so they have to actually present documentary evidence into the record at the immigration uh court proceeding um this regulation acfr 1003.41 dictates what the record of conviction consists of um and it could be any of the following um that that evidence is the the fact of a criminal conviction, right? So either you have a record of judgment and conviction, you have a record of plea deal, verdict, sentencing, docket entries, minutes of court proceedings, abstracts, basically anything that's official from a court document. Now, there are ways of challenging evidence that we're going to talk about specific ways that you as, as the criminal defense attorney can limit what comes in to the record of conviction um, towards the end. But overview in terms of what what is going to come into play um what i would say the best advice is if you are going to have a a a a proffer of facts um that's going to be laid into the record during the sentence sentencing colloquy for example um what controls here there's two very good cases um actually three that i cite here the Karimi case from the Fourth Circuit, U.S. v. Sims, and U.S. v. Harkoum. Um, and this deals with uh, facts that are assented to by the defendant in the criminal proceeding. And this also deals with the facts that a lot of our cases, as we know, in Maryland begin at the district court level and then go up to circuit court level. Well, the district court, as you all know, has their own separate charging document, the statement of charges, sometimes the crim uh, criminal information, and then the circuit court has their separate uh, charging document. Sometimes it's the indictment, sometimes separate criminal information. The, the district court charging documents are not always incorporated into the circuit court case. And so um, you want to avoid, and I know the statement of charges usually is, is always filed in these cases by DHS. And I always object to it unless it's been explicitly incorporated into the record. And the reason why is because of Sims and Harkoum. Those cases basically state that unless... The district court charging documents were explicitly incorporated into the circuit case they're not admissible and that's very important because you're going to find that a lot of times um, dhs may not get the appropriate records and and then they don't meet their burden of proof right if you have a conviction that that, that landed in circuit court and dhs is only filing district court documents well then that's not going to be sufficient to meet um, their burden of proof um, and then likewise um, during the sentencing colloquy, if you if if the prosecutor reads a, a proffer of facts and then you do not object to that proffer of facts, then it's going to be taken as an assent on the part of the defendant. And that's going to come into play again in terms of the proffer of facts that the immigration judge is going to look at. Now, the one thing I would say to you is that irrespective of everything I'm telling you, when it comes to relief, when it comes to us applying for cancellation or removal, adjustment of status, everything comes into play even that statement of charges that may not accurately reflect uh the facts that your client assented to and i see erica we have a question yeah i think there may be a little bit of a delay as the questions roll in because i think this applies to the last section but somebody's asking if someone is inadmissible if conviction of conspiracy to distribute um yes that would render them that would certainly render them inadmissible um conspiracy to distribute and and then it's going to, and we're going to, which is a good segue into our next slide. Um, if depending on the CDS, it's going to, it may be an AGFEL. Um, it may not. Um, I'm going to go through these a lot quicker because we're, we're short on time, I'm seeing. Um, but yes, that would, that would trigger an invisibility on the 212 ground, um, uh, on the reason to believe ground, and on the regular CDS ground. I think that would be a problem. Absolutely. And, and keep in mind, like I said, for purposes of inadmissibility, there, there are no exceptions uh, at all. So any CDS offense is going to render your client inadmissible. Um, anything else, Erica? That was the last one that just rolled in. Okay. So let me go through these quickly. I'm going to focus, um, and, and I've, I've cited to the case law, we're going to go through these a lot quicker. Um, these are some of the recent case laws regarding Maryland-specific statutes. Uh, the Moncrief case is the first one that I mentioned. This one did not deal with the Maryland statute, but I think it's applicable to the Maryland statute. Uh, the long and short of it is, is that because under the Maryland law um, distribution, and we're talking about the Maryland distribution statute here, um, 
if it deals with marijuana, um, number one, what is the drug? Okay, if we're dealing with marijuana and the, the, the conviction is to possessing with intent to distribute or even distribution of marijuana, under the Maryland statute, there is no required uh, element of remuneration um, and there's no required element of, a, of an amount, right? So you could literally be sharing socially um, a, a blunt with a friend and you could be convicted of possession with intent to distribute um, or distribution of marijuana. And because of that, um, the Maryland statute is overbroad. Um, and what we would apply is a Moncrief case to hold that it's not an aggravated felony. And I think that the, the immigration courts, immigration judges, Board of Immigration Appeals across the board has agreed that, in fact, Maryland's um, possession with intent to distribute marijuana is no longer considered a, um, a, an aggravated felony. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. I, this is specific to specific to marijuana. OK, um, this is not specific to any other drug. If it deals with uh, cocaine, if it deals with ecstasy, any other drug. No, it's only marijuana. We go to the next slide, please. And again, this is all the application of the categorical approach. OK, the Maryland statute is overbroad because it does not under federal law. There is a there is a. Uh, a misdemeanor exception to any uh, possessing possession of marijuana that deals with uh, distribution of marijuana, rather that deals with a small amount and no remuneration. And because of that exception, we get the benefit of that under Maryland law. Um, so this is my favorite example, just to illustrate what the categorical analysis is. Um, what is the categorical analysis? Like I told you at the beginning, you're looking at the state statute. And really what you're looking at is what is what is the minimum conduct the state statute criminalizes? Um, when I was when I started practicing immigration law, I saw many clients who were deported because they had convictions to Maryland second degree assault uh, statute. And, and they were charged as being deportable uh, for aggravated felonies, crime of violence. So, you know, in, in one case, I remember I had a client who had been convicted of second degree assault. He threw hot coffee at his girlfriend, which is not a nice thing to do, but um, they ended up resolving their issues and he was a green card holder. And and two years later, immigration comes knocking and then they detain him and they want to deport him. He had gotten an 18 month suspended sentence to second degree assault for his conduct. Uh, but of course, he was not advised that this would mean automatic deportation. Um, and so. Under the analysis uh, of the categorical analysis, um, Maryland Second Degree Assault uh, looks at what is the minimum conduct. And, and there was a, a, the case from uh, Fourth Circuit, U.S. v. Royal, which looked at what is the minimum conduct in Maryland. And, and again, in Maryland, all that's required is unconsented, unlawful touching, uncon uh, unconsented touching, right, without permission of the person. Um, that's the minimum conduct. And... Under the categorical analysis, you have to assume that your client and the courts have to assume that that was what your client was convicted of is the minimum conduct. Even if your client was convicted of taking a bat and beating someone over the head with it, which is not good, they could have technically pled guilty to second degree assault. But under the categorical analysis, we're looking at the minimum conduct. And so therefore, um, you know, in that in that case, this was pre royal pre day comps. Um, we had to do a vacator for my client. Um, Otherwise, he would have been deported. And, and fortunately, it worked out for him, um, even though we had been arguing, you know, that the statute was overbroad. You know, it was just commonplace for anyone that had a second degree assault conviction in the state of Maryland to be deported if they received a sentence of a year or more. Um, that's not the case anymore. Uh, so second degree assault is no longer considered a crime of violence for that very reason. If we go to the next slide, because it's it's overbroad as to the um, federal definition of what crime of violence is. Um, now, the one thing I would note here, um, again, is that, um, and, and by the way, it's not a crime of violence. It's also not a crime involving moral turpitude. Um, but the one thing I would note is that for our clients who have, uh, again, back to my original theme, there's no one size fits all advice. Uh, for our clients who have TPS, it may impact their status. For our clients who have DACA, it will lead to uh, termination of DACA. For our clients who have no status at all, it's going to lead to enforcement action. And depending on the circumstances of the case, 
the facts of the case, it may or may not render them ineligible for relief from removal. So keep that in mind. When we say second degree assault is a, is a safe uh, plea, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to result in no immigration issues at all. Um, let's go through the next ones really, really quick. I see we're almost out of time. I do apologize. Um, by the way, um, my number is on on the PowerPoint. If you guys have any questions, we can. I'm happy to discuss any specific cases you all have. Uh, my cell phone is two zero two three eight four two six four seven. And what we do sometimes here is we do provide advisory opinions um, that help in terms of these negotiations with uh, the prosecutors. Um, I'm going to go through these very, very quickly in two minutes. Uh, Maryland's theft statute. There was a great case that came out in 2018, Martinez v. Sessions. The quintessential CIMT, in fact, was theft. Well, guess what? Maryland's theft statute is so overbroad that it's no longer CIMT. And Martinez v. Sessions, the Fourth Circuit case that we highlighted here, is the case to look at. We go to the next slide real quick. Um, and then there's a there's a series of, of offenses that deal with sex abuse crimes, U.S. v. Gomez, Cabrera Amanzur, Amos v. Lynch. Those are very important cases that dealt with uh, former uh, provisions of child abuse or sex child abuse statutes um, dealing with crimes of violence or sexual abuse of a minor. Um, I think uh, the sites are there for you guys to look at. Um, and, and if we go to the next slide, Larios Reyes v. Lynch was a very important case that came out in 2016. This actually, this case is very dense, but it, it does a very good job of describing the categorical analysis. Um, I co-counseled this case uh, with a colleague, Ben Winograd. Uh, we had a very great result for our client. Um, the, the Fourth Circuit rejected, remember what I told you, what we're looking at is how does the federal law define uh, the, the underlying ground of deportability, in this case, it was sexual abuse of a minor. There is no definition for sexual abuse of a minor. Uh, the board had um, issued guidance, a guidepost in matter of Rodriguez Rodriguez. And basically, in this case, because immigration law is very much um, administrative law uh, in many ways, um, the board found that, you know, Rodriguez Rodriguez didn't uh, uh, didn't accord what they were not going to accord it any Chevron or Skidmore deference. Um, and so they found that Maryland statute is overbroad. Next slide, please. Um, and, and that was a good result for our client. Um, we have a few other statutes. Um, this is a very important one that just came out recently, uh, a sexual solicitation of a minor, uh, Jimenez Cedillo. Again, it, it's very intensive uh, in terms of administrative law procedures that the board violated. Suffice it to say that now the board recently came out with this case after remand from the Fourth Circuit. Um, this, this case dealt with the fact that a lot, a lot of these Maryland sex abuse statutes um, are strict liability offenses. And one of the components of a CIMT is that there be a certain scienter element. Well, that had been the case, at least up until uh, Jimenez Cedillo. Now, uh, depending on the age of the victim, um, these are considered CIMTs. So just keep an eye on that. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, resisting arrest is another good one. Um, this is U.S. v. Aparacia Soria. Um, again, this case actually had to go in bonk before the entire Fourth Circuit because the, the panel originally found it was a crime of violence. The in bonk panel reversed um, and said that the Maryland resisting arrest statute is overbroad. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, OK, violations of protective order. I mentioned this briefly before. These are now problematic in Maryland. So if you have a Believe it or not, if your client is convicted of violating a protective statute, that's going to render them deportable. These are the seminal cases from the board that you guys can look at. Again, the citation is there. If we go to the next slide, please. Okay, and then there's a series of uh, 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 burglary statutes that the Fourth Circuit looked at. Um, first degree burglary is overbroad um, because of the fact that it... Um, defines dwelling more broadly than the generic offense under federal law. Next statute, please. Um, so that sometimes is going to help avoid the burglary ground of the AGFEL. If we go to the next slide, please. And then uh, the next one looks at um, the third degree statute um, under Maryland's third degree burglary statute. And that one also, in this case, actually, they did find it was a CIMT. So this is actually a bad case for us. Um, so keep an eye on that. Um, and then we have two, just a couple more slides. Um, 
If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, malicious destruction of property. There's no case on published case on point, uh, but we have had some unpublished cases finding it's not a CIMT. Um, and then I, I have there a site to a board statute dealing with the uh, finality of a conviction. That's important to, to keep note of. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, and then I want to point this before I end very quickly. Um, you know, uh, keep in mind that um, what you want to avoid as criminal defense attorneys are anything that is an aggregate felony. Those are just very problematic for our clients, very hugely problematic for our clients. Aggregate felonies, like I said, subject someone to mandatory detention and basically take away any and all avenues of discretionary relief uh, from our clients. Clients who've been here for over 30 years, who have family, who have jobs, uh, even though they might be sympathetic, they're not going to have that option uh, if they have an ag felt conviction. And again, this can be very complicated. So you do want to talk to an immigration attorney about whether a certain statute is, in fact, a um, an aggravated felony. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned DUIs um, again, DUIs, DWIs. Um, they are not grounds for removal per se, but they will um, impact individuals who are seeking citizenship uh, that are here as permanent residents. They will impact um, enforcement action by ICE. Um, there are two cases that are recent from the board that we have to be well aware of. Uh, Castillo Perez basically says um, it's a very convoluted case, but but basically it's going to impact anyone that has two or more DUI convictions within a certain period of time. It can impact um, their eligibility for cancellation or removal. Um, and and then it can impact also their eligibility for a uh, bond under a matter of Sinaiskis. Um, and so keep in mind that those are two important cases that deal with DUIs. Um, for our clients. And then finally, um, I would say, if we go to the next slide, um, and we go to the next one, I, I, on TPS DACA, like I said, just keep in mind that a lot of our clients do have TPS and DACA. Um, they will trigger, uh, they can lose TPS by conviction of a misdemeanor or two felonies, and DACA uh, is, is, is much more stricter in terms of what will lose someone, their DACA status. Um, so those are those are much more areas, much more, much more sensitive areas uh, if your clients have those statuses to keep in mind. Um, and then finally, I would say um, for those of you that do, I know Erica does a lot of uh, post convictions, um, quorum nobuses. Um, there are two cases, a conviction, uh, uh, any vacator um, must be compliant under matter of pickering, which basically says it has to be based on a procedural or substantive defect. Um, and then recently there was a case from the board uh, certified by the attorney general where he said applied this same rule, even though that hadn't been the case to sentence modifications as well. And so that's kind of the, the if we go to the last slide. That's kind of the uh, the way of the land now in terms of immigration. I know that was a lot of material to cover, but like I said, um, I encourage you all to please call me if you have any questions. I'm happy to speak about any and all specific matters you all may have. Uh, my cell phone is 202-384-2647. Uh, and I do work with uh, a number of attorneys. So I'm happy to help and answer any questions. And I think that's it. I'm a little over my time. I apologize for going over a bit. And I just want to take this one last opportunity to thank Jimenez to thank Andy and Bob, and to thank everyone who tuned in today. Hopefully, we'll all be get, able to get together in person soon. Everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you so much uh, for attending the program.